Hey, Duvid here. We are live. I'm going to go through and talk some more chess today. So hopefully these are somewhat interesting for people to uh, see or view. But, uh, you know, it's largely my own research, and I'm just doing these videos. Uh, you know, put some information out there. Hopefully it's valuable to a wide swath of people interested in uh, psychology, heart problem, consciousness, my multiple truth hypothesis. Um but also just to people who play chess. And, you know, as mentioned, I had my chunking video and uh, speed reading. One of the first videos I did was just teaching the speed reading technique. And I mentioned, you know, the scientific evidence. And, and you know, the question, what does the scientific evidence say? And the scientific evidence um, is uh, is questionable on speed reading. So let me, let me pull up... Uh, you know, that video, and then I'm going to go into reading basically a PhD thesis that I found from an interesting uh, student, but it puts together all these various theories, and I have a lot of these papers, and, uh, you know, so I want to go over, um, I went over the previous time, so let me just enter a screen share, and I, I apologize, a little scrambled here, it's hard to uh, um, just ramble, and I'm trying to uh, you know, I'm going to watch this back for myself, and this is actually like a mental experiment, and I am putting forward a scientific theory, but it's difficult for me to you know, express that. So I have the screen share here. You know, For example, here chess, and here's all these papers. The, the other streams I want to do in reincarnation, in the soul, and the goy, Gentile, uh, slavery. Um, but chess, I want to start putting out material. I have a lot of these famous papers on chess, and uh, I hope to go through a lot of them, um, including up to the most current understanding and uh, evidence and uh, major theories. So the, you know, you see all of these uh, various papers. Here's this new paper. It's only semi-related. I saw this Vladimir Kramnik. I'll put this in the chat. Hopefully, you know, some people will have uh, some sort of time to uh, watch this. Um, yeah, Jane, I mean, that, that's the point of this lecture is to, uh, Jean, is to mention how the mind forms thought, how to become a good thinker. So I'm not really being like a chess coach so that, like, you know, you could go win some tournament and win some trophy. I'm really focusing just on how the mind forms thought and using chess as an example. But chess is a good example because there's skill levels. It's a clear type thing where one person performs better than the next. So, I mean, chess.com is supposed to be having a series with uh, Kramnik, and they're talking about variants. Kasparov has mentioned that I'm saying, like, these are smart guys. These are chess players. They're more gamers, uh, but they've read the literature. So let me get uh, just this video on speed reading that I, I wanted to show um, that, that I did a long time ago. So I put this in the chat, and uh, I did this video on speed reading already over two years ago. And, uh, you know, you could see um, I have it time stamped. In the beginning, I, I found some PowerPoints, some uh, slides to go through to just teach the basics of speed reading and uh, how you do it, what is chunking, what are the techniques, how to read with your finger, and these various things. And I believe in, I believe in speed reading and uh, that it works. I talk about this famous uh, uh, forgetting curve where your chance of forgetting and then reviewing in, in a time range. And, uh, you know, I mentioned the heuristic and the Talmud because the Talmud generally says that uh, if you review something four times, you'll remember it when you hear it. If you review it 20 times, you'll be able to say it in your own words. If you review it 100 times, you'll know it word for word. And if you review it 101 times, that's where the divine reward comes. Um which is interesting as a heuristic and, and also to think like, is it really understanding or thinking or is really memory the, the only thing? So, uh, you know, to mention the chunking theory would seem to point at the fact that memory really is the only thing. There is no thought process that occurs in the brain. Thought is actually a process of uh, memory. Um, but, but that's interesting. You say, what is actually the scientific evidence say? What are the best minds on consciousness? Um, stay, you know, say like the skill building curve of uh, kind of like the waxing and waning of progress. Also like in chess, how do you improve at chess? 
Um, so I, I read some papers that talk about uh, chunking. So I even have that here still linked. And uh, here's actually uh, um, practices to build chunking skills. And it actually has, um, you know, verses, it, things spelled out that will help you chunk is the same. Like when you speed read ideas, you can only hold um, five to nine ideas in short-term memory. Um, but you could hold big ideas in short-term memory. Just because you can only hold five to nine uh, ideas in short-term memory, you could still hold five to nine very large ideas in short-term memory. And those things that you hold, those chunks, could hold multiple things. So, you know, the example, these are three-word chunks. And it's just a way to look through this and help build in your mind these chunks for speed reading. I didn't actually go through any of these. Um, I just basically do it like like playing chess. You could uh, do exercises or you could just kind of play a bunch. And, uh, you know, I go, I go through the psychology of reading comprehension and the various studies, even the ones that track eye movement, they're going to be very similar to uh, the chess studies. Um, and uh, you know, there were studies here in uh, eye movement tracking and uh, spaced repetition. An another um, idea that are all going to be similar to chess. And then at the end, I had these German slides. I went through slides in Germany to demonstrate that like science really doesn't agree that you could speed read. But here you can see that there's people that have proven to be able to speed read and have comprehension. But generally, you see the curve. As you read quicker, comprehension goes down. Um, but here you could see that it was tested and it was clearly documented that there were people that read faster with the comprehension not going down. Um, and, and so, you know, there's various studies that uh, some question um, you know, how, do these anomalies actually exist? And it's similar to chess or something like that. It's saying you shouldn't be able to do uh, what, what you do, um, you know, because, you know, science says it's impossible. So I want to talk about, uh, you know, what, what science says about what happens when a person plays chess. So let's look at, uh, you know, I, I did these videos in the multiple truth hypothesis, and uh, I started out with... Uh, yeah, I'm, sorry. I'm basically going to end up reading a, a paper. I, I appreciate uh, people tuning in, and I'm trying to uh, phrase this in a way, and really I'm just practicing that I'm going to watch this back myself and think about how I phrase this. But, uh, you know, I did my first video on the multiple truth hypothesis. Thank God it's got almost uh, 500 views, a lot of view hours, you know, probably a good uh, 50 people watch the whole four hours. Um, you know, but I, I talk about uh, the philosophical background, um, of the philosophy of science, uh, metaphysics, uh, scientific realism, various things. I read through some papers, and then I give a background to cognitive dissonance, because cognitive dissonance, the science of cognitive dissonance, is a well-worked science that largely corresponds with most of the current models of um, the neuroscience of consciousness. And uh, so I went through quite a bit of discussing the current state of the science of cognitive dissonance because it's going to be a key pillar in the multiple truth hypothesis, but also the multiple truth hypothesis coming from different areas. And I read that paper from the geologist that first introduced, uh, you know, the working with multiple hypothesis uh, paper over 100 years ago uh, for, you know, just the idea of science where you have all these different uh, things that contribute to a cause and uh, you, you have to recognize that all of the causes are in play and uh, you know, have um, now you might be able to have a mathematical model uh, that would uh, you know somehow model to say, okay, here are all the various causes and their correlations, and you know try to set up some sort of series of differential equations to represent that. In the second video on the multiple truth hypothesis, I talked about the computer science of truth discovery, and I even went through uh, you know a little bit of the computer programming behind it and the in the various theories of how you go about programming computer and mathematical like function of like a artificial intelligence what if you tried to get the computer program the computer to discover the truth and you know like a uh, financial price discovery you know, there's a concept of uh, a truth discovery and the truth discovery function that like in theory that you would set a computer to uh so to say, discover the truth is very similar to 
um, the analysis of uh, a chess position and uh, you know analysis of uh, how a chess engine would go about that and, and possibly about how the human mind uh, would, would go about that. So I read through that paper at length. There's other stuff I'd like to go through um, more on that. And then I actually um, read a little bit about uh, the multiverse. And I, I get tech marks, um, you know, MIT paper, and I go through, um, you know, and, and he's got his very good diagrams, and I go through two different tech mark papers. Um, and I, I'll talk a little bit about Bergson. And then I start to get into chess and the expert mind. And, uh, you, you know, so I'm putting together the multiple truth hypothesis is really based on multiple things. And then finally, I produce this chess stream of uh, De Groot, the you know, famous book I have on my shelf. I didn't prepare to take it off my shelf. I won't go get it. Um, but, uh, you know, Adrian De Groot, famous uh, book on thought and choice in chess. And I go through kind of the history, you know, why that's this uh, great book um, that uh, puts in the scientific perspective of what goes through a person's mind. Um, also, historically, you know, Kotov, Think Like a Grandmaster, and there's really these great books on meditation um, that uh, you have to think in the language of chess to understand Kotov's Think Like a Grandmaster. But like in terms of impulse control, controlling your own mind, to think about like in a Hindu perspective of uh, or even Kabbalistic uh, you know, per person who has fine tuned his uh, meditation skills to control our own minds um, that think like a grandmaster is really a great meditation book. Uh, so, But I didn't read through much of that, just mentioned it. But I did uh, read through uh, at length quite a bit of Cleveland's 1907 psychological psychology of chess and learning to play it and his interesting thoughts on it. You know, like Kramnik was saying, like, to win. I mean, the, the fact is most people play chess because they enjoy the sensation of winning. But it was saying, like, Duvid taught chess at uh, all the king's men and chess in brain games, that chess was just um, a path towards becoming a better thinker. Like, being good at, at chess in and of itself is largely worthless, but being a better thinker is extremely worthwhile. Um, and, and, you know, being able to control one's own mind and focus. So, you know, these concepts about attention, <coughs> pardon me, and, uh, yeah, I look through the psychology of chess, uh, uh, Krogilius' psychology of chess, and I actually read through quite a bit of that. Um, but the scientific material comes later from a recognition of uh, De Groot's thought and choice in chess. So De Groot largely based his study on um, introspection where he spoke to top players and uh, asked them what they were thinking. And then later it was kind of felt like introspection is not that valuable. You need a scientific test that's not based on a person's own uh, recollection of what was going through their head. And we'll talk about the evidence now that shows it's a different part of the brain that puts together these explanations and actually does it. So when a chess player explains to you why they did it versus when they're playing and actually does it, those are different sections of the brain. So it's unlikely what they explained to you was actually the reason they did it. And this has been well demonstrated in many psychological testings related to chunking theory. And I also go over the basis of how computer programs operate, including uh, alpha zero, alpha beta pruning. I found some good slides. And I, you know, I, I go, I read through parts of the famous uh, Chase and Simon's uh, perception in chess, and then Gobit uh, um, studies of that and the interesting uh, theories. So, and then I, I did a just for the more chess players. I've been using the example of Crazy House because I think it's uh, you know more combinations than regular chess, and it's less studied than regular chess. Regular chess has been very well studied. So, you know, doing even, you know, prove myself by being a top in the game. They're saying that Duvid, uh, you know, could demonstrate, uh, you know, somewhat I know what I'm talking about to even say I'm, I'm from the 100 best in the world at two different uh, chess variants. And, you know, even looking at uh, one of the top player, the finisher, um, uh, you know, study and, and going over, looking at his games and some way I, I talked with him when I was in a league with him this kind of how he goes about thinking about crazy house and the chunks are a little bit different than in regular chess, but the, the chunking theory, um, you know, so that 
I'm not going to focus so much on the chess in these videos. I'm focusing almost purely on the science behind it. But, you know, so now we're caught up and we see, uh, you know, some of what I've been uh, doing. And I largely want to, uh, you know, so here you're just a paper, eye movements in reading and human information. And I, I went through this in the a stream I did on... Uh, um, speed reading, and, and this one even has like charts. Um, but I have these type papers also for um, for chess here. You know, seeing that about eye movement and these various studies, so it's very interesting. Uh, but for my own purpose, you know, to get it very clear in my head, and uh, you know, for anyone who uh, really wants to understand these subjects and uh, you know wants to listen to me read. A PhD thesis. So I found this Florida State University, 2008. Uh, Roy Roaring, um, reviewing expert chess performance, a production-based theory of chess skill, and uh, this is a dissertation submitted to the Department of Psychology and the fulfillment requirements for a degree in the Doctor of Philosophy, for which he was awarded. And uh, you know, thank God his uh, PhD thesis is public information. So I found it online. And, and it's very good. It, it, it's an extremely good uh, overview of the various uh, material and understanding of what's going on in the current state of it. So, um, you know, rather than me try to explain it, I think I'm just going to read this. And for people who understand the chunking theory, um, I mentioned in the speed reading that also memory studies show that you understand things but best when it corresponds to multiple sense perceptions, reading, saying out of your own mouth, writing with your hands, typing these different reinforcing behaviors that, you know, so to say, create chunks. And uh, it's not clear whether chunking theory is actually true. Neurologically, it makes sense that the neurons wire and they wire because uh, of an experience and it creates a chunk in the wiring. And then this pre- uh, this made wiring from experience is like a memory. And so in the next shot, when uh, your neuron is fired, that it uh, um, can actually um, you know, fire a whole chunk. So that's why I say chunking is probably the mainstream, um, um, well, I'll say answer to the soft problem of consciousness, like how uh, thought could arise from neurons in some sort of process, although, you know, obviously Duvid does not agree with these theories and largely a dualist and think that uh, thought does not in fact arise from the brain, although it could be memory does. And it could be that there is a neural imprint from memory, um, but uh, Duvid in essence looks at uh, the idea of brain as a transmitter to the spiritual realm. But I'm not going to be talking about that. I'm just going to be giving the mainstream overview of what does science say about what makes a person good at chess. And it's not what you think. You know, I was uh, kind of trolling a chess match on uh, Lee Chess the other day and, uh, you know, saying, like, it's not what m most people think. You're saying, like, uh, top chess players generally do not have exceptional IQs. And, uh, you know, the various skills, in fact, it's completely undetermined what certain skills make a person good at chess. It's actually very interesting how difficult it is to make a determination. So, uh, you know, hopefully this is going to be interesting to quite a few people, but like, you know, if not, it's largely just a mental um, skill building activity I'm doing for myself to uh, understand these issues better. So, you know, let's read uh, from this uh, PhD thesis that, uh, you know, says it much better than me. Um, so, you know, just use, uh, you know, this man's uh, work to put it to some use. Explaining expert chess players' dramatic superior skills represents an outstanding unsolved theoretical problem for cognitive psychology. This review extends and reevaluates the current state of theories of chess skill, highlighting the strengths and weaknesses of various theories, ranging from general abilities to chunking theory to more modern variants. After describing limitations with earlier approaches, a new theory is described based on productions relating stored organizations, presto, of chess pieces and memory. I discuss how the theoretical framework extending it and elaborating Erickson and Nish's proposal for a long-term working memory in chess addresses established empirical findings, makes testable new predictions, and how it relates in several aspects to the earlier theories. These predictions 
are examined in three studies illustrating how the model can explain characteristics of chess problem solving and planning behavior, as well as historic increase at the highest level of skill. Okay, so uh, appreciate the people in the chat. Like, uh, so this kind of going to hit, uh, you know, just like me reading a whole bunch of this uh, study. Um, but anyone interested in the study, you know, could be useful. Um, you would have to search. I think I did download it, but you could search probably this and find it online. Or you know, someone who really wants to, you know, hopefully it'll be uh, beneficial. And I myself am going to rewatch this back later as you know a method to really try to internalize uh, um, this. So I you know even have at the tip of my fingers. Um, you know, an encyclopedia knowledge somewhat of all of uh, the thought and theory of uh, chess excellence, uh, you know, from the science point of view. Near the beginning of the 20th century, psychological studies began to investigate the high levels of skill demonstrated by individuals in real world domains. These studies discovered evidence for superior performance levels beyond those observed in more traditional laboratory settings, feats of expertise such as playing multiple games of chess blindfolded or mentally computing products of very large numbers are often difficult to explain using theories of learning and cognition derived from more simplistic tasks. One, future of ex one virtue of expertise research is that it pushes cognitive theory beyond its comfort zone, forcing theories developed from human performance on on-practice laboratory tasks to accommodate and explain the extreme achievements of certain individuals. As this review will suggest, during the last four decades, early models of cognition struggled to handle the empirical findings from research on expert performance. Research on expertise has subsequently led to improved methodologies for understanding human performance in a variety of domains, ranging from ballet dancing to bridge play to wine tasting. However, after early studies such as Binet, 1894, Brian Harder, Cleveland, over half a century passed before more refined attempts to investigate high levels of skill evolved. In his pioneering research, De Groot investigated the thought processes and memory performances of chess grandmasters and club level chess players and described many qualities of the thinking and search characteristics of these high levels of achievement. His work was originally published in 1946 in English 1965 when the cognitive revolution was in full bloom. With psychology returning to the study of mental thought processes uh, to a computer metaphor of human cognition, many researchers such as Herbert Simon, Alan Newell, and other prominent scientists sought a model organism for cognitive psychology, much like the fruit fly uh, Drosophila is a model for organisms for genetics. This was already widely researched by computer scientists at the time, representing an outstanding problem in artificial intelligence, how to create a computer program that plays excellent chess. This must have added great appeal for researchers such as Simon, who later championed the notion that computer simulations of human thought represent complete cognitive theories, similar to systems of differential equations in physics. Inspired by De Groot's work, Simon argued that chess would serve cognitive psychology as this model organism, uh, the Simon and Chase paper that I read uh, large parts of in the previous video. Noting many important characteristics of chess, finding the best move in a chess position is a highly complex real world human activity, and each chess position represents a well defined problem environment with a fixed number of identifiable moves that can be played at any given point, perfect for studying search processes and problem solving. Chess has other highly desirable characteristics as well, including an objective metric of individual differences in skill. Subsequent work by Chase and Simon first demonstrated the classic skill by typical uh, interaction for rapid recall of chess positions, where strong players show memory advantage primary when recalling briefly presented chess positions taken from actual games, but not necessarily for positions with pieces more out of less randomly assigned to squares. Based on this and related empirical results, the authors argued for a theory of chess skill that incorporated key concepts uh, from theories of memory, including Miller's notion of chunks stored in a fixed capacity short-term memory. Chase and Simon described chunks as patterns of chess piece constellations in long-term memory with labels that could be stored in short-term memory during the recall of a position. Consistent with models of basic cognitive processes, this theory allowed the work of the mind to consider uh, to occur in short-term memory rather than long-term memory. Short-term memory is analogous to attention under these notions. Given that long-term memories being vast in number cannot be directly retrieved, but must be retrieved via a queue already stored in short-term memory. The work of Simon, Newell, and Chase further offered a new paradigm for measuring and investigating expert performance. If expertise is a function of stored chunks, 
then skill could be measured by comparing the memory performance of experts and novices on recall tasks as having more chunks should monotonically improve performance. Moreover, as in chess, domain experts' superior memory should be constrained to typical situations and should show little, if any, advantage in atypical situations. In fact, the skill by typical interaction was later found in a large number of other domains, including the board game Go, uh, Bridge, musicians, basketball players, computer programmers, and electronics. Simon argued that an understanding of skill in chess would provide insight into expert performance in a large number of other skills, arguing that such mechanisms such as stored chunks and limited capacity memory stores might explain high performance in a wide range of different domains. However, competing theories of chess skill have been developed over the last three decades. In recent uh, review, Gobit 1998, um, who I read quite a bit of that paper also in the previous video, compared different theories uh, with data from chess memory tasks. The review compared the original chunking theory of Chase and Simon, a theory based on knowledge and searching, uh, the theory of long-term working memory, and the template theory. Gobit included that in addition to accounting for most of the data on chess memory, the template theory, as did the chunking theory, offers a comprehensive theory of expertise, including perception, memory, and problem solving. Given this relatively recent review of chess theories, it is important to clarify why a new theoretical review is needed. Gobit's review had several critical shortcomings. First, Gobit committed several inaccuracies in his description of opposing theories, culminating in a sequence of later exchanges in the British Journal of Psychology, uh, Erickson and Gnish highlighted Gobit's misunderstanding of their model when they state how they agree with Gobit's extensive criticisms of this mechanism, but not with his claim that long-term working memory proposes generic retrieval structures as part of its mechanism. Second, some of the empirical findings described by Gobit are incorrect. One example is a statement that regarding long stimulus exposure times, the recall of random illegal game positions brings their chess experts' recall of peace location close to that of weaker players, which is inconsistent with uh, Gobit and Simon 2000, who found that stronger players' recall advantage in random position grows with increasing exposure time. Third, as will be clear in this review, several relevant empirical findings have emerged since this review was originally published, as well as other relevant findings and even theoretical perspectives that were ignored. Finally, Gobit's 1998 review extensively draws upon findings from performance on chess memory task in evaluating different theories. However, evidence exists that the task is not representative of chess expertise, as will be discussed in this paper. In fact, Gobit has only recently began an attempt to expand his theory of chess memory performance to chess skill more generally. Overall, a new review is needed to fairly evaluate existing theories and frameworks against the appropriate and up-to-date empirical evidence for the full domain of skilled chess performance. In this paper, I review existing theories of chess skill, their key weaknesses, and ultimately I propose a new theory of chess expert performance that explains the key empirical phenomenon relevant to any theory and that suggests testable novel predictions. I bust. No, I apologize. I still have Baron Metal on my desktop and uh, hope to get to it. I just have so many other activities that are more pertinent to my day-to-day -day activity, but I appreciate the book. and It is right on my desk now for over a year. So review of the theories and their primary sources of evidence. General abilities. One of the original explanations of high level of chess performance is that chess masters have greater general mental capacities or at least greater capacities regarding visualization, spatial skills, and or memory. The effect noted uh, by Binet, 1894, the surprising capacity to play blindfold chess, as well as the large individual differences in chess playing skills might be a product of chess players having greater mental powers in general. This attitude was reflected by British officers during World War II who recruited chess masters to help them as code breakers and cryptographers. If an individual can play such masterful chess, the person might also be capable of other impressive mental feats, a view even supported by some modern researchers. However, studies attempting to find evidence that strong chess play requires high levels of general abilities have been consistently unsuccessful. A review of this research reveals very little support for this hypothesis. The first study to investigate the mental powers of chess player asked very strong players and non-chess players to perform a variety of cognitive tasks, 
All of these tasks, the authors found that chess masters could only demonstrate superior performance on memory for chess positions. This is inconsistent with general abilities hypothesis, which would have predicted superior performance for the chess masters. Another early source of evidence was a study by Baumgarten, 1930, of the intellectual facilities of one of the most famous chess prodigies, Samuel Ryshevsky. As an eight-year-old boy, Ryshevsky later became the U.S. chess champion and even competed for the world championship, being one of the top players during the middle 20th century. As a boy, Ryshevsky had toured the U.S. playing against adults in exhibitions, where he frequently defeated many of his uh, opponents. However, Baumgarten found that young Ryshevsky performed very poorly on tests of aptitude, such as verbal tests performing worse than five-year-old boys from Berlin. Though he performed above average on some memory tests, given that Ryshevsky has no education up to that point, save learning the Talmud and some Hebrew, such findings could easily reflect the selective education environment. More recently, studies have found evidence that as a group, chess players tend to have an above average IQ. This might be interpreted in several ways. However, as we'll discuss later, there's no correlation between chess skill and IQ within chess players as a group. The finding that chess players have above average IQ scores could support the hypothesis that playing competitive chess requires innately higher levels of general mental capacities. However, this would not explain various counterexamples, namely chess mastery of IQ scores below 100. Ryshevsky aside, a study of Dahl and Mayer in 1987 found that as a group, strong German chess masters rating between 2220 and 2245 had a mean IQ score of 106.5, uh, significantly higher than 100, um, but with standard deviation of 7.5, hence their sample of master players must have included some individuals with a lower than 100 IQ score. The existence of such individuals shows that having a high IQ is not a prerequisite for achieving high levels of skill. Hence, some other explanations is needed for why chess players tend to have above average IQ scores. However, much evidence exists for at least one prerequisite to play high level chess, the notion of deliberate practice. The concept of deliberate practice organized as a distinction from domain experience is defined by Erickson and colleagues as particular activities as training that is designed to improve specific aspects of performance. In many domains of expertise, including chess, it is clear that many individuals do not improve even after years of experience. For instance, in many uh, in chess, in many of the more experienced players in the New York's world famous Marshall Chess Club have not improved in decades despite playing frequently throughout each year. Similar casual golf and tennis players typically do not improve over time, and this finding is true in many other domains. However, these individuals reaching plateaus in domains performance are probably not engaging in deliberate practice. In deliberate practice, aspiring performers must focus on the aspects of performance at which they are weakest and engage in problem solving to master these areas. Because this involves frequent failures and high levels of concentration for extended periods of time, deliberate practice is not inherently fun or enjoyable. Most individuals reach a performance level they deem acceptable and then cease engaging in deliberate practice resulting in performance plateaus. Erickson observed violin students at prestigious music academy in Berlin and investigated retrospective estimates of their daily deliberate practice before entering the academy. These authors found that most accomplished music students showed a striking difference from the other groups. Although all students engaged in roughly 50 to six hours a week engaged in music related activities, the best music students spent much more time, 25 hours per week, engaged in solitary practice. Compared to less accomplished music students who spent less time, 10 hours per week. During solitary practice, these musicians reported high levels of concentration to master specific aspects of their performance, often based on teacher feedback in weekly meetings, thus meeting the definition of deliberate practice. The finding that elite individuals spend more time in deliberate practice has been extended to many other domains, including chess. Charnas and colleagues have demonstrated that the best chess players engage in consistently more solitary study than lower rated players and also own far more chess books, whereas frequency of tournament play was only a weak predictor and was generally not correlated after controlling for solitary practice. Um, study found evidence for group practice as a predictor, although this variable contained practice with others in addition to tournament games. Moreover, extreme motivation to reach very high levels of skill appears necessary to engage in deliberate practice and even predicts chess attention, attrition. Chess was the inspiration for well-known uh, 10-year rule, as few chess players have ever reached the international level with less than 10 years of experience. 
and even some famous prodigies, such as the world-famous Bobby Fischer, took a little under a decade to reach Grandmaster level and only competed for world championships some 22 uh, decades later. There's little doubt that deliberate practice is required for chess improvement. Through the mis uh, microstructure of practice, of practice activities has not been thoroughly investigated. Typical players report studying collections of archived chess games in books to test their move selection prowess against the moves played by strong masters in these games, receiving feedback and new ideas. Subtle aspects for many studies have provided indirect evidence that strong players must be studying tremendous numbers of master level games. Often studies have small sections showing informal comments by masters after seeing positions chosen from obscure sources such as there's a vague recollection of a fine four game, or often the chess master will be able to recognize the position and even state which game it was chosen from. This is impressive considering the thousands to even millions of games that exist in published literature, that to be able to recall or recognize a specific position from a master game, even if imperfectly implies that thousands must have been studied. In fact, the group offered some suggestion on the development of chess player based solely on the biographical data of a number of chess masters, data extracted from the chess literature from the most part, but also complemented by the author's personal communications with former world champion, Dr. Max Yu and Hans Kamak, as well as own information on personal experiences with chess masters. He claims that developing masters devote an exorbitant amount of their time, not only to playing, but also to analyzing thoroughly every game of their own and often those of others, not to mention studying the theory of chess. Moreover, by means of playing experience and our textbooks, the player gets to know certain important generic strategic and tactical rules. Next, he learns to recognize and handle exceptions to those rules, which in turn grow into new, more refined rules with new exceptions. Finally, the player develops a feeling for the cause in which these already highly specialized rules can be applied. We will discuss the group's notion of rules more thoroughly in the conclusion of this paper, but exactly how players study and code these games has not been carefully examined. Additionally, modern chess players also report spending hours of daily study time on chess openings. Openings, though now well-defined, typically refer to the sequence of the first moves in a chess game that a player has played from memory. Older textbooks tend to define it based on accomplishing basic strategic goals, such as uh, piece development and castling. Today, entire books are published on very specific openings covering, for instance, all the known variations or plausible move sequences and ideas in a specific position occurring after 15 to 20 specific moves have already been presumably played. That some players have memorized this vast quantity of information speaks to persistent and extended training efforts. Further potential evidence for the role of practice is the persistent correlation between starting age and playing strength, as younger players tend to have more time and opportunities for practice. Another idea related to general abilities in chess is whether playing chess improves mental functioning and leads to higher IQ, which could explain why chess players have higher than average IQ scores. Hence, the below average IQ scores of some chess players would have been even lower before learning to play chess, according to this argument. However, evidence shows that chess masters do not have higher IQ scores than intermediate chess players, despite the strong evidence that they have engaged in thousands of more hours of practice. First, as mentioned earlier, Several studies have replicated a null finding, namely that chess ratings do not correlate with IQ scores. Moreover, studying finding above average intelligence in chess playing children, Friedman and Lynn found the average full scale, scale IQ scores between three groups of increasingly higher ELL ratings did not differ significantly. Although one study found a raw score correlation with rating in a very weak child players, it was not significant after controlling for grade level as higher grade students would likely have higher raw scores. A recent but related study argued that chess skills correlated with IQ after controlling for practice variables in school children with lower ratings. However, the measure of chess skills were not rating, but rather a chess skill test that was partially based on knowledge of the rules of chess. It is possible that higher IQ children in this relatively weak sample of players have greater knowledge of the many obscure rules of chess independent of general chess skill. Interesting. The same study found no relation with IQ in their elite subsample of children and even found a trend for negative relation with IQ in their chess ELO rating. The absence of correlation with the same IQ test in adults and finding the correlation between skill and IQ tend to diminish with longer professional experience has been shown in many domains, including chess. The Friedman and Lynn study investigating French child players 
found a mean IQ of 121, which is not too different from the Raven uh, IQ of some of the highest rated players of all time. Gary Kasparov, who scored 123 during the peak of his career. Notably, the Horgan and Morgan study administered the Raven IQ test to seven adult masters and experts, where six of the seven subjects, including 160-year-old, had scores of the 99th percentile. These players were therefore have Raven IQ scores higher than Gary Kasparov, despite having ratings more than three standard deviations lower. To summarize, even though chess players as a group often have higher than average IQ scores, chess skill generally does not correlate with IQ. One of the best chess players of all time has an IQ score lower than some of the much weaker players. Some famous chess prodigies and master level players have IQ uh, below average IQ scores. Finally, there's even evidence that individuals with high IQ scores do not improve at faster rates. Hor uh, Horgan and Morgan, 1990, found that Raven IQ tests did not correlate with improvement in rating after controlling for the grade of their child participants. Dahl and Mayer found that the full-scale BIS IQ test did not correlate with either a one-year or two-year change in chest rating. There's even more converging evidence from studies of older adults who typically perform far worse on IQ tests than younger adults do not show very large age uh, decreases in performance. These age effects tend to be quite small and sometimes do not even show in small samples. Perhaps the best explanation of these findings is that individuals in highly social economic status and more academic environments are more likely to be exposed to chess and playing tournaments to obtain ratings. This also explains why some studies did not find superior IQ for chess players relative to non-players when the players and non-players were matched for education. Moreover, this would explain why there are some very low IQ chess players and why improving chess skills does not improve IQ score. Tournaments, chess equipment, and membership into chess organization all have financial costs as well as time costs, which is advantageous for higher social economic status with correspondingly higher IQ scores. With more financial resources to purchase learning resources, playing clubs and tournaments, and free time for practice, more of individuals with higher IQ scores may be more likely to surround themselves with activities like chess, which are often considered intellectual. Also, personal characteristics may lead specific types of individuals to play chess. Such an explanation is consistent with findings that individuals who take up chess have higher big five uh, scores than those who do not, including greater openness, extroversion, and lesser levels of agreeableness. Um, notably, openness is also typically correlated with IQ, meaning that it's possible that this char personal characteristic is the cause of chess players often higher than average IQ scores. Finally, although higher IQ is not satisfactory explanation of superior chess performance, it may be that better chess players have superior general visual spatial abilities, better memory performance, or other higher abilities. Such an argument requires at least two findings, namely that as a group, chess players are higher than the general population for the ability in question and that the ability correlates with chess skill. However, again, the evidence does not support this. Waters, Gobin, and Leiden, 2002, found that chess players do not do better than controls on visual memory tasks and cited no result for earlier works that found no correlation between chess rating and spatial ability. This finding is consistent uh, 1927 findings as well as the no results between chest strength and other basic cognitive tasks. For example, 2007 uh, found no correlation between chess skill and simple reaction time, long-term learning of names and faces, and both verbal and spatial working memory span. Moreover, as we will discuss throughout this paper, chess players do not even exhibit much better memory performance for chess positions when the pieces are quasi-randomly assigned to squares. Overall, it seems unlikely that chess players are superior in any general cognitive ability and that deliberate practice best explains their support perform superior performance and improvement over time. The question to be answered by theories of skill is what exactly is changing during improvement and what mechanism explains their superior performance. Okay, pretty fascinating. Sorry, I'm, I'm down to only three people. Um, as said, this you know, could be considered largely, uh, you know, just for me and uh, you know, people who follow my theory or come back later to watch this. Um, you know, hopefully, we'll be able to gain from it. Or, or someone who just has a hard time reading these papers currently uh, by themselves, you know, could listen to me and. Uh, um, you know, be be all right. Sorry, just uh, checking my messages. Okay, so other early theories. 
One of the first steps in studying experts intuitively could be to find out what the experts think and how they believe they demonstrate their skilled performance. Though not rigorous as data, the suggestion of experts might stimulate plausible new theories of how skill, particularly skill at chess, might actually work. Given their experience in the domain, not surprising, the early investigators attempted exactly this. Without a doubt, these early investigations provided inspiration and motivated many modern theories of later work on chess skill. However, these verbal descriptions of these authors, like the descriptions from players themselves, suffer from ambiguity and are not grounded in modern psychological paradigms. Consider the following example explanation for improvement in chess. Progress in chess is like progress in abstract thinking in any other kind uh, consists in the formation of an increasing symbolism which permits the manipulation of larger and larger complexes. But what does increasing symbolism mean? What are these complexes and how do they produce superior move selections? In fact, today, in an earlier work, the large number of rival theorists as well as empiricists in chess skill are former tournament chess players, but many are still rival theorists. Chess playing authors have uh, included uh, Chris uh, Chabris, Neil Charnas, William Chase, Adrian de Groot, Dennis Holding, Fernand de uh, Gobit, Petri uh, Sarnaluma, Herbert Simon, uh, Han van der Maas, and Eric uh, Wagenmakers, among others, including the author of this paper, including Duvit. Chunking theory. <coughs> to better understand the chunking theory, we will first review the earlier work that led up to this point, how it influenced generations of psychologists with a new approach to studying complex plot and how it evidence inspired the concepts of data cited by Chase and Simon. In his pioneering research, De Groot attempted to investigate the complex thought processes in elite players using the think aloud method. In many ways, De Groot followed in the footsteps of many psycholo uh, psychologists dissatisfied with associationist psychology trend towards investigating the simplest and most basic cognitive processes, and instead attempted to describe the structure of thought of individuals performing highly complex tasks the think aloud method described by De Groot asked participants to think out loud while the complete tasks so that the verbalizations can be treated directly as data. This method was later scrutinized by Erickson and Simon, 1993, in a large scale review, who argued that with correct experiment procedure, no evidence exists contradicting the fundamental assumption of non reactivity, namely that subjects' cognitive processes do not change due to thinking out loud. They further argued for the treatment of verbal protocols as objective data where the ideal approach involves roughly three steps. First, the task analysis determines different process models for how a specific task can be completed. For example, in solving a math problem 25 times 36, the task analysis could reveal many strategies. One strategy might involve the traditional approach of multiplying five times six and carrying the three and so on, whereas another strategy might transform a 25 to 0.25, which is a quarter, and 36 is 9, making 900. Given a list of uh, different uh, process models, a step can be carried out, namely the development of coding scheme. In the multiplication example, the experimenter might look for unique intermediate products. Here, the number 15, 30, 18, 6, 180, and 72 would be expected for the traditional strategy, but not for the second, whereas hearing 0.25, a quarter, and nine would be expected for the second strategy, but not for the first. In the final step, participants' verbal reports are elucidated using a simple procedure, and the data is coded and analyzed. If one participant in the multiplication task verbalizes, okay, 25 times 36, let's say, uh, pauses, carrying the three, 180, okay, 900, the analyst would be able to rule out the second strategy thanks to identifying the 180, an intermediate product that would not have been generated using the fraction strategy. The protocols are used in this way to reject models but not prove them given the possible incompleteness of any given protocol. The strategies that cannot be rejected are potential candidates process models for a given test. However, De Groot did not approach his think aloud data quite this uh, rigorously. He was more descriptive approach which aimed to describe the structure of thought processes rather than to identify candidate models. Um, one might plausibly place his study as the first step in the above process namely task analysis. Further, De Groot originally studied some of the most famous chess players at the time that had completed, uh, competed at international tournament in 1938. In this early year, De Groot did not have access to tape recording equipment and suffice to use pencil and paper to help record thoughts on chess players and then to review them 
with the player directly after the task, despite his rough and ready experiment uh, techniques. DeGroote discovered several important characteristics regarding the structure of chess players' thinking. He described the first problem behavior graphs, though the term was later coined in the procedure redefined by Nolan Simon in 1965, which shows how the chess players consider sequences apply during the task of choosing the best move from a single chess position. In his experiment, DeGroote chose the chess positions he had personally analyzed for years from his own game, himself being a master level player and he was thus quite certain of the best solutions. Moreover, positions, particular position A, was solved by almost all the grandmasters in his study, but by very few of the weaker players he recruited. These positions captured essential aspects of chess skill, finding the best move in a chess position and differentiating the best from the weaker players. However, one of the group's most striking findings about the differences in the thinking structure between the master players and the immediate concerned is proto- called data, namely he found no significant differences in the structural characteristics of search. Most of the protocols analyzed by the group contained repeated sequences of moves, um, you know, like knight takes pawn, rook takes knight, uh, so on and so on. Um, you know, wins a pawn, might be compensation, uh, you, one side is better, uh, forced. Um, from this sequence of moves, the actual protocol was much longer. There's only a snapshot of problem behavior graph can be constructed. The graph is essentially a tree of variations, sequences of moves considered by the player. In problem behavior graphs, researchers often evaluate characteristics such as number of different base moves uh, called episodes, uh, maximum or average depth of search, number of evaluations, number of different moves, number of total moves. From his data, the group discovered that most chess players, after initial appraisal of position, uh, begin an alternation of plans and with it, the continual return to the original ideas that must not be construed as vacillation or wavering. However, since the successive elaborations, a progressive deepening and broadening of the investigation is apparent. Hence, in order to search deeper into a position, chess players often restart their analysis of a given variation. The analysis of the given uh, general phrases of chess problem solving marked an important step forward and showed how masters often find stronger moves as a result of the search process. However, when de Groot analyzed his protocols for the number of base moves, the total number of moves, the moves per minute, and the depth of search, he found no significant differences between the strong and the intermediate players. This was surprising, especially as many players often assume that chess players are better than others because they think more moves ahead. However, de Groot found no evidence that grandmasters think further ahead than intermediate players, nor do they appear to search more broadly or consider more total, total moves. It is not generally possible to distinguish the protocol of Grandmaster from the protocol of an expert player solely on structural and or formal grounds. To explain the individual differences in chess skill, De Groot noted that the Grandmaster immediately knows what it is all about in which direction he must search. He immediately sees the core of the problem in the position, whereas the weaker um, expert player finds it with difficulty or misses it completely. According to De Groot, if consequently the master can start thinking from a higher level, then this class expertise difference should come out clearly in the first few minutes, nay, seconds of the perception of the thought process consistent with this notion. De Groot replicated an earlier finding that chess masters have superior memory for chess positions, except using a very uh, brief presentation time for the stimuli. He found a sharp skill effect for recalling these positions, even at this very short uh, presentation time. The search structure from protocols revealed important information relevant to a general chess theory of problem solving, but the absence of effect leads many to later researchers such as Chase and Simon to argue that they did not play any role towards individual differences in chess skill. Chunking theory. Description. Inspired by DeGroote's 1965 work, Chase and Simon tested hypotheses that can be thought of as the converse of an empirical fact. More skilled players have superior chess memory, so might having superior chess memory result in greater chess skill. In other words, they hypothesized that perceptual recognition of patterns stored in long-term memory might underlie chess skill. Simon had already developed a model of human memory known as EPAM, Elementary Perceiver and Memorizer, of Feinbaum, of Feigenbaum and Simon, that was similar to other models of memory. In fact, it shared many characteristics with the heavily influential model, a modal model developed a few years later, including a short-term memory and long-term memory, uh, and was used to explain a list of memory effects. 
the notion of short-term memory used by Simon, and later offers centers around empirical experiments a few years earlier, uh, Brown uh, 58, Peterson and Peterson 59, which discovered that after building proactive interference, individuals are unable to remember even a singly newly presented word or consonant trigram if distracted for a brief period of time, typically 20 to 30 seconds. Moreover, as argued by Miller, 1956, short-term memory is capable of uh, constrained, uh, capacity constrained can hold seven plus or minus two chunks of information. For instance, seven or so digits, meaningful groups of digits, letters, words, and so on, where chunks are stored in long-term memory, the mathematical constant pi might be a chunk in long-term memory uh, for 314. The classic EPAM model set fixed parameters derived from experimental results for the amount of time to encode a new information to long-term memory uh, between 5 and 10 seconds. So according to EPAM, any information presented for 5 seconds or less would have to be stored in short-term memory. If chess skill derives from a collection of chunks stored in long-term memory, then skill at chess might consist of two primary uses of this store, selective search of a chess position via chunk recognition and superior evaluation of positions also via chunk recognition. However, the notion of chunks in long-term memory formed a bias for the Chase and Simon model, and this was the assumption that the earliest empirical experience began testing. Chase and Simon, 73, set out to test their hypothesis by presenting chess positions for five seconds so that chess masters would have a, to store that stimuli in short-term memory. They would only be able to store one chunk in long-term uh, in this interval, and then try to validate that their superior performance recollection of the placement of more chess pieces would reflect seven plus or two, uh, plus or minus two chunks of information, reasoning that such meaningful chunks would have developed through the course of chess study. They developed two sets of stimuli, one with chess positions taken for actual chess games, another where the positions originally taken from games uh, quasi-randomly reassigned the pieces to squares. They tested three chess players, beginner, immediate, and mastered, and discovered the now well-known and often replicated skill by typically uh, a typicality interaction for chess position recall, although the interaction was not yet uh, statistically generalizable in this small study group. Here, stronger chess players show their memory advantage only during the recall of typical positions, not random positions, as the typical positions should be the only ones containing meaningful chunks. The study went further and attempted to create a method for analyzing the content of these chunks, Chase and Simons observed and videotyped chess players' reconstruction of a position that was uh, perceptually available in plain view. They recorded the number of times that players looked back at the perceptual available positions to reconstruct it on the board, how many pieces were placed between glances, and the between, oh, and the between and within glance time intervals. They found that within glance intervals were usually less than two seconds and that stronger players tended to take less time between glances. They used that about two seconds is necessary to recognize a chunk, to label it, and then store it in short-term memory. Further, they investigated the number of relations in these chunks and found that the groups of pieces within glances tended to have multiple relations, like attack, defense, same colors, uh, same piece, proximity, unlike groups of pieces between glances. The next step was to argue that pieces placed within two seconds during recall of a position Similarly correspond to chunks. Chase and Simon found that the size of the inner piece latency time between two recalled pieces was inversely proportional to the number of relations between the piece and strong correlation between the type and number of relations for groups and pieces within glances in less than two seconds during memory recall. But the relations within glance placements did not correlate with relations for latencies greater than two seconds during recall. Moreover, relations of pieces placed between glances correlated very highly with relations of pieces greater than two seconds. After demonstrating the high correspondence between the type of relations and the two conditions, they showed that the average chunk sizes between two and four pieces together with the actual recall performance indicated a capacity of about seven chunks. Most middle game positions had between 21 and 30 pieces. They also found that strong players tended to have larger chunks. By their definition, in the memory task, and that most of these chunks were pawn chains, a castle of king position, or clusters of pieces of the same color. These findings led Chase and Simon to develop a theory of chess skill. They argue that over years of practice, chess players acquire a large vocabulary of these chunks in long-term memory. Chunks are stored patterns of pieces on squares, meaning that a chunk is typically defined both by the pieces as well as their locations, which was supported empirically in later studies 
showing that uh, transposing board quadrants decrease memory recall. Notably, although Chase and Simon did initially allow that some chunks might exist independent of board locations, their simulation work to assume all chunks were stored with their specific board locations. However, these chunks alone cannot produce chess moves. Chase and Simon argued that these chunks or patterns are associated in long-term memory to labels that in turn are associated to chess moves. In other words, the chunks are the input to productions which output moves. The theory can easily explain the skill by typicality interaction, given that chess masters have vast quantities of chunks for typical game positions where the piece constellations will mask the chunk in the master's memory, giving him a large short-term memory advantage. However, in random positions where no chunks are apparent, the master will lose this advantage, though a slight advantage may still be evident from accidental chunks in random positions. According to this theory, when a to-be-recalled chess position is displayed, the player first scans over and notices salient pieces, then specific groups of pieces around the salient pieces and recognizes as chunks in long-term memory with the corresponding labels of the chunks placed in limited capacity short-term memory. During recall, the player accesses short-term memory directly retrieving the short-term memory label, so the long-term memory chunks, which are then recalled. Simon and Gil Martin, 1973, developed a computer simulation of the model memory-aided pattern perceiver, MAP. From their simulation's performance on recalling chess positions, Simon and Gil Martin estimated that a master's vocabulary could easily extend to over 50,000 acquired chunks, similar to the number of words used in many languages. Overall, the original chunking theory is most well-known theory in chess performance and often cited in cognitive psychology textbooks. However, despite its apparent parsimonious and intuitive appearance, later research has considerably weakened the foundation of this theory. Problems with this theory. The argument that chunks of pieces on squares are stored in long-term memory and associated with moves via productions and appealing the simple and parsimonious theory of chess performance Stronger players play better chess primarily because they have larger vocabularies of stored, increasing larger chunks, suggesting that DeGroote's failure to find any differences in the search processes of differently skilled players was due to be better players' superior already deriving primarily from rapid recognition of the stored patterns. It is compatible with observations that elite chess players require years of experiments, experience, and it converges well with mainstream psychology uh, logical theories of memory. The strength of this theory was later enhanced when his prototypical empirical prediction, namely a skill by typicality interaction for recall domain, domain recall, was observed in many other diverse domains, suggesting a broad, almost domain general theory of expertise. Given its pervasive influence, the Chase and Simon Chunkin theory has received greater empirical scrutiny than most other theories of chess skill. However, under the microscope of empirical data, the theory proved at best overly simplistic and perhaps largely wrong in many key respects. Even the original work, the chunking theory had recognized limitations in what it could explain. Chase and Simon discussed several subsequent findings to their initial work on recall positions, namely long-term memory for chess positions, long-term memory for chess games, immediate recall of move sequences, and the task known as the Knight's Tour. However, rather than explain each of these findings with the notion of chunks as constellations of pieces or squares stored in short-term memory, Chase and Simon explicitly mention additional mechanisms. They argue that the differences in chess skill manifest themselves in the speed with which successful new chunks are retrieved from long-term memory. Three or four seconds per masters, six or eight seconds per class A players, and about 12 seconds per beginners. Therefore, not only does the stronger player have more chunks in long-term memory, he or she can retrieve them faster. Another experiment, Chase and Simon required the players to recall memorized games after delays, noting the experts have hundreds and perhaps thousands of sequences of moves stored away in long-term memory. The top players have thousands of opening variations, some running over 40 plies deep uh, committed to memory. There are also hundreds, perhaps thousands of traps and winning combinations of moves that every master knows. Now the chess expert has more chunks, retrieves the chunks faster, and also makes use of the scored move sequences. Uh, though these stored move sequences might also be chunks of some alternative variety. The third experiment, which compared memory of random versus meaningful move sequences, found that skill effects in move sequence memory for both coherent, meaningful, and random move sequences. 
Finally, Jason Simon validated the existence of skill differences on the Knights tour. However, it's highly unlikely that pieces on square chunks could explain the skill effect, given that only five pieces are involved, four black pawns and a white knight. Grandmasters can do this task faster than skilled intermediates. Intermediate players often have many years of experience themselves, so simply being more familiar with the basic knight movements cannot explain this away. Overall, even from their first study, Chase and Simon theory was less parsimonious than appeared in later citations, including far more mechanisms than piece on square chunks and associated pro productions. Moreover, piece on square assumptions of the Chase of the Simon and Gilmartin simulations was inconsistent with other empirical results, such as skill effect on the error of commission. Holding 1985 points out that 75% of these errors of commission were translation errors questioning whether pieces are tied to specific squares. The translation errors might involve shifting an entire configuration such as a pawn chain or else uh, misplacing a major piece like a rook or bishop along its own line of control. According to Holding, this would suggest massive reductions in earlier estimates of the number of patterns that must be remembered in order to support chess mastery. Also unexplained by chunking theory is an impressive phenomenon known uh, even by Binet, where chess masters can play entire games without looking at a chess board known as blindfold chess. This accomplishment, often demonstrated by intermediate and strong players, requires access and memory to a tremendous amount of information, and by comparison, most novices are incapable of playing even a handful of moves blindfolded. Or according to Chase and Simon, the master's short-term memory is filled uh, by a single position, so how can a master player make stronger chess moves during blindfold chess and less consideration and evaluation of planned chess moves takes place in long-term memory. In fact, uh, Chabris and Hurst, 2003, found no significant differences between chess play during rapid blindfold chess and regular rapid chess, where the player has about 15 minutes to play an entire game. The master's short-term memory would be completely filled at any given position, so the master should be unable to calculate or plan, though this is not the case. Other aspects from the original study allow for criticism, particularly with the proposed method of identifying chunks. In particular, if the successive placements of pieces Within the two-second boundary are chunks stored in long-term memory. The chess player should consistently select the same chunks across repeated trials. However, upon investigating this, where a chunk was defined as intact on the second trial of the memory task, if at least two-thirds of its pieces were recalled together, strikingly, by even this rather loose criterion, they found that 65% of master's chunks and 96% of class A player's chunks remained intact on the second trial. The authors did not report the proportions of the class A player's reliable chunks defined by having all the same pieces, as would be expected by the theory. Moreover, that only a little over half of the master's chunks are the same brings into question what these groups of pieces really represent. While the holding suspects that masters might make creative new insights into a repeated position, this possibility would both weaken uh, the chase and sign methodology as chunk reliability cannot be verified, and also potentiality add an additional component to the theory that is already growing in complexity. The method of identifying chunks also did not transfer well to another domain in the study of memory for typical versus random positions for the board game Go, where the skill by typicality interaction was found. Reitman did not find correlations between relations and chunks identified from a copying task and in chunks identified by the two-second boundary, unlike Chase and Simon. Reitman tried a large number of different boundary conditions and failed to find the correlations in each case. If the chunking theory of chess is extendable to other domains, chunks in such domains should be identical by, by the same methods. Moreover, the chunks explicitly identified intuitively by experts often overlap contrary to the assumptions of independent piece on squared chunks, and later experiments showed that chess masters also segment positions into overlapping units. Later experiments even suggested that the representation of chess players' recall of a position is hierarchical in nature, also violating the independent assumption of Chase and Simon. Finally, it's unclear how most of the chunks identified by Chase and Simon would pl plausibly generate moves. For instance, often chunks fail to capture interesting relationships in the position as 75% of the identified chunks were pawn chains, castle position and pieces of the same color. Even Chase and Simon were a little surprised at the importance of those visual properties. And related to this, we were surprised that the players made so little use of the attack relation. In verbal protocols, chess players often report attacking relations, and it's difficult to explain why they're so rare in chunks and holding in Reynolds. Even found that unmoved pieces 
not verbalized as moves and protocols were significantly more likely to be remembered than pieces actually moved. Moreover, whether proximity can really be considered a relationship between pieces is quite debatable. If only attack and defense are considered plausible piece relations, much of the data linking copy chunks to recall chunks is questionable. Overall, the two-second boundary method lacks reliability, uh, face validity, and generalizability for the identified chunks. To support the validity of the two-second boundary, Gobin and Simon, 1998, replicated the large sample of many of the analysis of Chase and Simon. However, these authors did not examine the most critical problem of the two-second boundary, namely reliability of chunk placement. If chunks as identified by the two-second boundary represent information pre-stored in long-term memory, chess players should consistently recall the piece constellations from a given chess position, but this was not examined by Gobin and Simon. Other potential issues arise as well. They involve an assumption that is difficult to test, namely that in the copying task, the assumption that one chunk is encoded per glance for example, it is possible that multiple chunks could be encoded in a single glance and that this might vary with skill, particularly if stronger players have larger visual spans and require few, fewer fixations when choosing a move. Also, master subjects may have studied the position longer before placing pieces during a copying task, and one master did not even look back at the to-be-copy board even once. His data was admitted from the analysis. One of the most compelling aspects of the original theory was its relationship to Miller's magic number of seven plus or minus two chunks as the capacity of short-term memory. Defined by Chase and Simon's two-second boundary, the chess experts tended to remember about the right number of chunks. However, the master remembered about seven to eight chunks on average, which was greater than the intermediate and beginner who remembered between four and six chunks, although no statistical tests were applied. The finding is not consistent with other domains showing a relation between chunk size and memory span. Simon observed his own verbal memory span performance, finding that as chunk size increases uh, from a word to two words to a sentence, that his chunk span immediate order recall decreased. However, the chess master and Chase and Simon's experiments had larger chunks and a larger memory span. Furthermore, his span was greater than recent estimates for visual short-term memory of around four chunks. But perhaps the most devastating findings for the assumption that chunks are stored in short-term memory come from the different studies showing that this cannot be entirely true. According to many cognitive models, including Simon and Gil Martin, information in short-term memory is erased once it is replaced. Hence, an interfering task requiring short-term memory between the encoding of a chess position and its subsequent recall should dramatically reduce recall performance if chunks are stored in short-term memory. However, a study by Charnitz found that various interfering tasks, including mental arithmetic and mentally rotating copying abstract symbols, do not produce large drops in chess position recall for strong players. Moreover, a study by Frey and Adsman in 1976 showed that players could actually recall two separate positions at a time, which should not be possible based on Chase and Simon's model, where short-term memory is filled by just one. However, for one possibility way to introduce an additional mechanism that could explain this later finding, uh, Gobin and Simon, 1996, these studies provided strong evidence that much of chess position is stored in long-term memory, despite that positions were presented at very fast rates, about five seconds. In fact, long-term memory variables, such as death of processing, may also affect position recall, further supporting this later position. In fact, it turns out, even the skill by typicality interaction itself changes meaning at longer exposure times. One of the key arguments was that chess players perform no better than novices when chunks are absent. Hence, in random positions, later replications of the typicality by skill interaction have revealed small skill efforts for random positions. And although these authors attempt to argue that chunks are occasionally present even in these random positions, experiments during the last two decades reaffirm earlier work that given 60 seconds instead of five, large skill effects on recall are observed for random positions. This deviates significantly from the original findings of the chunking theory and again forces the theory to add supplementary mechanisms to account for this. Moreover, the interaction van vanishes both when a recognition test is used rather than a recall and when different information intake tasks are examined, such as counting bishops and knights, or when a position is presented auditorily. auditorily. Also problematic are studies showing either that skill exists without memory effects or that memory effects exist without skill effects, a double disassociation. Charnas observed that a sample of older chess players with equivalent ratings to younger 
sample had a worse performance on a memory task. This was evidence for memory effects on the absence of chess eff of skill effects. Moreover, Holding and Reynolds found that higher rated chess players made superior move selections in pseudo-random positions without showing a memory advantage. Hence, this possible double disassociation weakness, uh, the idea that any chunks possible supporting the memory task also support better chess play. Clearly, there are many problems with the original theory proposed by Chase and Simon and simulated by Simon and Grimaldin in summary. The assumption of short-term memory use is not defensible, leaving the primary empirical findings unexplained. The main empirical result that skill by typicality interaction does not hold at long exposure times where experts show larger recall advantages. The theory continually adds ad hoc additional mechanisms to explain different chess phenomena, and primary only explains recall of chess positions. The memory recall task shows a double disassociation with chess skill. Several of the most important chess phenomena are not explained by the theory, including blindfold chess. The method of identifying chunks is highly questionable, is not reliable or domain general, and it is unclear how any of the identified chunks could be associated with moves. It is unclear how chunks are acquired during practice. Finally, one of the earlier results that motivated the chunking theory was the Groot's 1965 protocol analysis showing essentially no significant differences between elite chess masters and intermediate level players search characteristics. The finding led to De Groot as well as Chase and Simon to expect skill differences to emerge in the first few seconds of the task, inspiring the memory stimuli. However, the empirical relationship between search characteristics and chess skill may be quite different than assumed by these authors, as will be discussed in the following section. The current picture is not entirely clear. If chess players really do search more broadly and deeply or even more rapidly than weaker players, this would potentially provide evidence for different mediating mechanisms. Moreover, the search characteristics arise for the most representative task of chess skill, move selection, which accurately captures in vivo chess performance. The first rival theory for the chunking hypothesis focused heavily on search, as will be discussed in the next section. Search evaluation and knowledge theory. Description. The theory proposed by Holding argues that three components underlie chess skill, namely skill at searching, skill at evaluating, and chess knowledge. In outline, SEEK states that skilled players use his knowledge to generate an efficient forward search with accurate evaluations, differences in these three components of chess skill, rather than differences in specific memory for patterns, are what the model takes to characterize the dimensions that separate higher and lower rated players. Holding presented empirical evidence for skill effects on these three dimensions. Several studies show that stronger chess players are better at evaluating positions. Moreover, I find evidence from De Groot's protocols to indicate how chess players are superior at evaluating. For instance, during the search process of one position, both grandmasters and weaker players arrived at the same endpoint in their calculation. In this uh, position, although the weaker players sense nothing promising in the position for several of the grandmasters, this was already a strong enough position to decide upon the chosen move. The example provides an exceptionally clear case of when stronger players and weaker players both consider the correct solution and resulting position, but the weaker player's poor evaluation skill is insufficient to realize the quality of the play. Both the weak player and the stronger players found this position, so by chunking theory, both players must have the chunks to generate the moves, but only the strong players evaluated it correctly. This claim is strengthened by computer analysis of the position from De Groot, showing that the depth to a clear material advantage is deeper than all the players searched. Many of them did not see that it wins a material advantage, but rather only that it leads to superior position and even said so in the protocols that they could not see a material advantage. Skill and positional evaluation must be critical in this position. Second holding points to research illustrating that stronger players search more deeply and more broadly than wider, weaker players. According to Groot, found no significant differences between grandmasters and intermediate players. Holding points out that grandmasters did search significantly more efficiently, namely by searching more unique base moves per unit time. He argues that the Groot study had a few subjects and thus very little power to detect differences. And he points out that the search variables showed trends for the stronger players in the appropriate direction. Moreover, he argues that even small differences in search parameters like depth of search would potentially indicate larger differences in actual searching efficiency. Back radio studies did find that stronger players had superior search. Charnas found an independent relationship via regression between chess skills and various search characteristics. 
including number of episode, number of terminal nodes, number of total moves, number of repeated base moves, maximum depth of search, mean depth of search, and unique base moves per minute. Holding and Reynolds found that the initial evaluations of a position changed significantly only for stronger players. Finally, Reynolds argued that analysis of DeGroote's protocols reveals use of a homing heuristic similar to those described by Newell and Simon that is applied more frequently by stronger players. This heuristic describes a trend for players to broaden the search after negative evaluations and shrink the search after positive evaluations. Third, several studies have shown that chess players have greater general knowledge of game. And these are quite strong effects. It is well known that strong chess players memorize long sequences of opening variations in many common endgame positions. Moreover, Holding argues that knowledge is actively invoked by players during the process of move choice. Holding explains the Chase Simon memory results by appealing to a process incidental to acquisition of chess skill. Instead, it appears that chess players who actively possess the given positions are able to integrate the general characteristics of these positions in a hierarchical prototypical or schematic format, not necessarily based on pairs of pieces that constitutes an understanding of the positions. This is clearly sufficient to account for the skills differences between players and with minor additional assumptions might also account for a tendency to replace a related piece one after another. Notably, Holding emphasized that some aspects of chess skill might be captured by the chunking model, but that his model places far more emphasis on search processes. In principle, there's no reason why recognition association theory should not coexist as a subsidiary component alongside a search and evaluation theory, although in practice there's a wide difference in emphasis between the two theories. One minimizes while the other maximizes the role of forward search. The two accounts of chess skill can be reconciled if one takes the view that the basic activity in chess play consists of exploring a search tree, but the candidate moves for a selective search are supplied by a recognition association mechanism. Problems with this theory. One of the critical empirical predictions of seek theory is that chess strength should correlate with search characteristics, particularly depth of search, However, as noted above, the empirical findings are mixed, although Charney has provided evidence for such correlation. The interpretation of this finding is not immediately apparent. For instance, Charney reports a follow-up on one of his participants for the earlier study after the individual had improved from weak to average tournament player to a strong master level playing. However, Charney did not find any significant changes in the search characteristics for this individual who had improved in chest strength over four standard deviations. Also, a study by Wagner and uh, Skura examined search characteristics of two expert level players corresponding to uh, ratings roughly of 2,000 strength, which is probably about equivalent to the group's stronger intermediate players. These players demonstrated their ability to search very deeply in chess positions, more deeply than many of the group's grandmasters. Thus, searching deeply into a position is not a skill possessed only by grandmasters, and this supports the original interpretation of the DeGroot analysis, which found no effect on search. These findings led Charnace to suggest the depth of search plateau after about expert level, as this study used players uh, ranging from beginners to about 2,100 in strength, so perhaps the skill by search correlation exists only in this range. The strongest players of the group sample were outside this range, and weaker intermediates were perhaps close to this rating. On the other hand, a recent study found evidence that supports Holding's view. Uh, Gobit 2004 of Campitelli found evidence that depth of search, along with other search characteristics such as breadth and speed, actually increase even up to grandmaster strength, arguing that mixed results from previous research derived from the stimuli used. In many chess position problems, deep searching is not required to find the best move, and many of the earlier studies may have used such positions, notably uh, though this study used a very small sample, and the exact nature of the correlations between search characteristics and skill remain unclear. However, Holding's theory did not link search, evaluation, and knowledge to basic models of cognitive psychology. For instance, do the search and evaluation process occur in short-term memory? However, SEEK is not specific enough to link a practice activities to the search, evaluation, and knowledge mechanism. While studying openings might result in greater knowledge, it is unclear how evaluation skills are improved and search is extended from the solitary practice activity that distinguishes improving players. Moreover, what prevents playing games for fun from improving search and evaluation? Additionally, how does Seek explain chess players' ability to play excellent blindfold chess? Holdings theory cannot address these questions, lacking the required depth and detail without a connection to basic cognitive models. Seek suffers from ambiguity and may be explainable with more elaborate systems based solely on chunks. 
Legobit 1997 suggests how chumps might affect depth of search. So long-term working memory. Description. Given the central problem with chunking theory was its reliance on short-term memory as the place where pointers to chunks are stored and thus as the place where cognitive work is carried out as an explanation of the chess recall data. Later authors divide theories for presuppose that the cognitive work occurred in long-term memory. Erickson and Ignish uh, coined the term long-term working memory to refer to this idea. In expert performance, they argue performers develop a method of accessing long-term memory as working memory instead of limited capacity short-term memory, and that they're able to do this by organizing relevant information into retrievable structures. Retrievable structures are objects stored in long-term memory that are basically a collection of cues that are associated with others, with each other in specific organization. Hence, only a single cue from context or stored short-term memory could access a retrievable structure in long-term memory, which then allows the performer to access relevant information in long-term memory via the cues. Given that the primary source of empirical data for the chunking model was the chest recall task, and given that later evidence contradicted the chunking model's assumption that chunks reference short-term memory account for this task, the empirical basis for chunking theory was essentially undermined. Um, the Erickson proposal for long-term working memory can additionally alleviate the problem of explaining the recall task by using a retrieval structure based on the 64 squares of a chess board. Each square is a queue and the board is organization of the queues. Thus the chess players encode piece locations and relations between pieces and the piece locations are stored in the 64 square retrieval structure and long-term memory. The retrieval structure will have you know, various queues. In other words, the chess position is represented as an integrated hierarchical structure relating to the different pieces uh, to each other and all pieces are associated with their corresponding locations. Now, because the retrieval structure and hence information about the chess position is located in long-term memory, inference in short-term memory will have little effect on its retrieval. Moreover, the skill by typically inter interaction is explained for both the five-second presentation rate and also the 60-second presentation rate where the nature of the interaction changes because at five seconds, recognizable relationships, which allow more rapid encoding into retrieval structure exists between pieces, primarily in typical positions, since typical positions can be more rapidly encoded into retrievable structures, resulting in expert advantage primarily for typical positions given only five seconds encoding times. However, longer time to encode the position, experts show an advantage even in random positions, having had more time to better associate information, less familiar piece relationships with the set of retrievable cues. This also consistent with uh, Saruluma's 1989 finding that skilled players show superior position recall in both game and random positions when positions are auditorily presented one piece at a time. Piece locations can be encoded and later retrieved even when no meaningful configurations of chess pieces are present. Finally, one information once information is coded into a retrieval structure, it can rapidly accessed whenever required. For instance, uh, Erickson and Oliver found that queuing a chess expert with any square of the chess board resulted in very rapid, about two seconds and accurate, over 95% retrieval of the information associated with that square. Our Erickson and colleagues have proposed that researchers move away from studying the memory recall task as evidence for skill theories. Primary reason for this is illustrated by a study originally conducted by Erickson and Harris showing that a complete chess novice with no experience of chess whatsoever can reach master level of chess position recall with only about 50 hours of practice specifically on the memory task. This finding has since been replicated um, by Saraluma and Lane, 2001, Gobit and Jackson. Moreover, skilled chess players improve their recall performance fairly quickly after exposure to the recall task. Erickson and colleagues argue that the central problem is that the recall task primarily probably does not capture the actual expertise, but is instead an epiphenomenon. If experts spend thousands of hours training to improve their skill, why would a relatively brief period of practice result in large performance improvements? Erickson and Smith suggest that researchers focus on tasks that are representative of the underlying skill. Such tasks would not show these rapid effects on brief practice. And in chess, the task that is most likely representative of chess skill is the move selection task originally studied by the group. Notably relative to move selection and other chess tasks, chess memory is one of the weakest correlates of chess skill. That information is stored in long-term memory rather than short-term memory is consistent with many different empirical findings, including memory tasks, 
as well as several other, other findings. For example, is consistent with the null correlation between IQ and other findings. For example, is consistent with the null correlation between IQ and chess skill, given that IQ is often highly correlated with short-term working memory. And short-term working memory is essentially bypassed in long-term working memory theory. This is further consistent with the small effects of advanced age and skill performance, as age tends to diminish short-term working memory capacity with most working memory tests. Moreover, preliminary evidence for neuro neuroscience corroborates the general assumption of long-term working memory. 2001 asked chess players ranging from 700 to grandmaster strength to play against a chess computer while recording gamma bursts, allowing them to identify activated neural regions. They found a strong relationship between playing strength and decreased use of the frontal and parietal lobes, together with increased use of the temporal lobe, supporting the notion that with increased chess skills, players rely more on information in long-term memory, the temporal lobe, than in short-term or classical working memory in the frontal lobe. Similar results were found by Campanelli, Govit, Head, Buckley, Parker, 2007. Importantly, the theory of long-term working memory is a general argument directed at skill in broader sense that does not claim to be a specific theory of chess move selection. It is cognitive theory that contrasts with models claiming that chunks stored in short-term memory give rise to expert performance by claiming that integrated retrieval structures in long-term memory contain the relevant information used by chess players during play. In short, chess expertise occurs primarily in long-term memory. However, the theory does not explain how information acquired from deliberate practice is refined over time and implemented in long-term memory to, great, to execute greater and greater skill in selecting chess moves. Problems with the theory. Gobit argues that long-term working memory predicts that chess masters should have superior memory from random positions that it then is observed. Within five-second presentation rates, strong chess players tend to have very little advantage over weaker players. However, as previously discussed, this argument is unfounded. Long-term working memory retrieval structures are not merely piece-to-square associations, but also coded into long-term memory via relationships between pieces. Hence, a random chess position having fewer obvious chess relations would take more time to code into long-term memory than a typical game position. Moreover, Dobin and Simon found that given increased time for encoding, the memory advantage of stronger chess players increases for random positions exactly as it would be expected by long-term working memory. Gobit has further criticized long-term working memory in a broader sense, arguing that it amounts to verbal theorizing and is ambiguous in its testable predictions. According to Gobit and Simon, Erickson and Nish 1995 alternative proposal of a single hierarchical retriever structure to store any type of chess position is not precisely enough specified to be tested against empirical data. In contrast, Gobit argues that computer simulations are required to fully specify the nature of cognitive processes and that verbal theories like long-term working memory are typically too vague to make testable empirical predictions. Clearly, the proof is in the pudding in this regards, meaning that only future experiments testing aspects of long-term working memory will show whether Gobit is correct in this critique. Overall, long-term working memory theory leaves open many possible ways of describing chess skill. Its central thesis being that skilled players work, store working memory information and long-term memory during play, and that this is used in updated and retrieval structures that is organized by the structure of the chessboard and coded via relationships between pieces. Moreover, long-term working memory takes issues with the notion of using chunks to explain chess performance, primarily when chunks are defined as units of short-term memory. However, long-term working memory does not fulfill, fully reject that stored constellations of pieces in long-term memory contribute to the individual differences in chess skill, rather than view these as specific patterns in memory that must be matched against perceptual features in a chess position. Skilled chess players may use such stored information to quickly and efficiently discover piece relationships in a given chess position. Okay, template theory. Gobit and Simon, 1996, attempted to address the primary experimental findings inconsistent with the former chunking model of Chase and Simon. A particular interest to these offers was how to address the findings incompatible with the view that the recall data may be explained 
by chunk pointers and short-term memory. Goldman Simon provided further experimental evidence that chess players' recall cannot be based entirely on short-term memory by showing how recall of multiple chess boards would require as many as 15 chunks in the short-term memory of strong players in some cases, clearly outside the short-term memory boundary of five to nine. Also recall in their experiments exhibited curvilinearity suggested a primacy and recency effect indicative of long-term memory storage. Without greater time to encode information into long-term memory, earlier models require about eight seconds to encode new information into long-term memory, driving from experiments with verbal materials, whereas broad presentation times were generally about five seconds for many chest recall experiments. Memory for briefly presented information must be based on short-term memory according to traditional chunking models. However, if information could be encoded in long-term memory more rapidly, the excess number of recall pieces and the lack of inference in short-term memory can be explained through recall from long-term memory. Gobin and Simon, therefore, add an extra component to the traditional chunking model, which they call templates. Essentially, a template is similar to a traditional long-term memory chunk, except that it's typically larger than five pieces on squares and often derives from specific chess openings, contains slots or squares with certain variable information. Either F3 square might contain a white knight and F2 a pawn, but F1 may be a variable. It contain a white rook or a white bishop. Notably, other slots and templates can be more abstract in that they contain information related to plans or possible moves, and these slots can be filled with information rapidly in a second, whereas the information is then part of long-term memory structure. Hence, information in a to-be-recalled chess position can be rapidly filled into a template allowing better recall from whatever information remains in short-term memory after an interfering task because each template requires only one pointer in short-term memory. Hence, according to traditional chunking theory, an interfering task would wipe out most short-term memory, allowing very little recalled information or perhaps only allowing recall from contextual information. However, if more information on locations of chess pieces can be rapidly stored in templates in about one second, each of which requires only one pointer in short-term memory, then much more information can be recalled by accessing the templates. In general, templates are theoretically necessary to explain the short-term issue, short-term memory issues with chess position recall and have the nice property of being analogous to other constructs in psychology, such as frames, schemas, and prototypes, or as uh, Church of Entropy say, archetypes. Like its older counterpart, template theory places the most emphasis on fast perceptual pattern recognition processes and explaining chess skills. Evidence often cited in supporting the importance of pattern recognition typically takes form as skill differences in chess play remaining robust under severe time restraints. For instance, Burns found that 81% of the variance in normal chess rating can be explained through speed chess ratings where players must typically make about one move in five to eight seconds. Similarly, Gobin and Simon found that top-level grandmasters still performed at a very high level despite having to make moves very quickly. Simulations. De Groot and Gobit developed computer simulations based on template theory to explain quantitatively the chess recall data, naming this simulation CREST, Chunks, Hierarchies, and Retrieval Structures, to illustrate how template theory is incorporated computationally and might derive specific empirical predictions. I will briefly review the mechanisms behind the simulation. Crest perceives objects, chunks, or pieces in a chess position via simulated eye. When possible, the eye uses the largest chunk met so far, the hypothesis to fixate a new square. That is, it follows the branch below the ch chunk and fixates the square associated with the branch. When this is not possible, crests either fixate perceptually salient pieces, fixate squares followed by attacks and defense relations, fixates new regions on the board, or makes random fixations. In this way, a group of pieces in a chess position can be presented to the simulation of objects. The heart of Crest is the modern variant of EPAM, Elementary Perceiver and Memorizer Network that was originally developed by Fagenbaum and Simon to explain empirical data from a host of verbal learning experience experiments. The network refers to the structure of long-term memory and how new information can be learned or stored in long-term memory. The structure of the EPAM network is the tree-like hierarchy of nodes serving as a discrimination network. In other words, at each node, one of several branches or tests can be performed on an object to determine the next node in the sequence. 
at each node of the network is an image. And this is where long-term memory chunk information is stored to access a specific chunk in long-term memory. An individual traverses a path from the root of a network to a specific image. And this path is defined by the specific elements contained in the object, chunk or single piece on square. Importantly, each node is numbered as it is created during learning. For conflict resolution, note the path to a given chunk need not fully define the content of that chunk. The path merely discriminates the specific chunk from all other chunks stored in long-term memory. Furthermore, the EPOM network is grown by familiarization and discrimination. Any perceived object is presented to the net via eye fixations, reaches a specific node in the network, and then is compared to the image of the node. If the image underrepresents the object, meaning the elements in the image are a proper subset of the elements in the object, new features are added to that image. If the information of the image and the object differ on some feature or some element, the new distinct node is created at that endpoint. That's familiarization and discrimination. Moreover, template slots are created when the number of nodes below a given node that share identical information is greater than three, when this to-be template chunk has at least five elements. Finally, similarity links can be created between nodes and templates. Uh, during learning, Crest first compares each chunk coming into short-term memory with the largest chunks already in short-term memory. If the two chunks are sufficiently similar, a similarity link is created between the chunks. This is used during later recognition. So if two nodes have similarity links, Crest selects the node with the most information value. Problems with the theory. Oh, Jennifer, thanks for showing up. The template theory attempts to revive the influential chunking theories of Chase and Simon as to cor correct the empirical difficulties of the early theory. However, in doing so, the template theory inherits many of the same problems, a key example of which is the lack of parsimony. For instance, the original chunking theory did not attempt to explain a large number of chess phenomena with only a simple notion of perpetual chunks, but instead posited additional forms of stored information, such as stored sequences of moves, specific types of knowledge, knowledge of typical plans, rates of chess specific uh, processing. Similar when Gobitz and colleagues have begun applying the notions of template models to non-memory tasks, such as chess problem solving tasks, the model immediately grows in complexity. Gobitz and Jansen develop a simulation model called Chump, chunks and moves and patterns, chunks of moves and patterns to try to simulate move selection processes with computer programs that play very weak chess, partly because it involves only pattern recognition and no search processes. However, Chump grows two nets one for patterns of pieces like crest and another for sequence of moves. And further, these nets are connected by associative links, which are created when the chunk patterns contain the piece on square to be moved. According to uh, DeGroote and Gobit, in addition to nets for patterns or pieces and for sequences of moves, nets could be created for openings, plans, heuristics, tactical concepts, positional concepts. In other words, individual differences in chess expertise cannot be explained with chunks and templates alone, but must also invoke stored move sequences, plans, tactical concepts, and many other constructs. Nodi Goblet had developed a second simulation of mood selection called search, which begins to incorporate search processes, but does not search more than one branch within an episode. Like Chump, this model adds additional cognitive complexity, for example, it incorporates a mind eye, which is a relational system that can be subjected to visual, spatial, mental operations, and that stores perceptual structures, both from external inputs and from memory stores. The template theory alone appears incapable of parsimoniously explaining chess skill, supporting other authors' criticisms of focusing empirical experiments on memory recall tasks. The memory recall tasks must not be capturing the essence of chess skills if it can be explained without the many extra cognitive constructs that even Gobet and colleagues argue are involved. In this vein, other phenomena such as nightmare performance and blindfold chess play do not appear readily explainable with only templates and chunks. Perhaps the most serious issue of the template model is the consequence of its method and implicit acquisition of chunks and templates. Wherever, whenever the model discriminates an object with its network, learning process automatically update the net. In fact, according to Gruden Gobit, in the case of chess, it is likely that some learning occurs when players are trying to find a move in a given position. However, the problem is that in individual differences of skill are based on quantity of chunks and templates. And if chunks and templates are automatically acquired during coding of chess positions and move selection, then chess experience alone should predict chess skill to a great extent. But as previously discussed, 
Chess experience is a very poor predictor of skill, and many chess players' ratings do not change even after decades of consistent playing tournaments. Roaring and Char Charnace found that most active chess players' ratings change very little over the course of adulthood, typically less than 100 rating points, supporting relative antidotal uh, accounts. The problem is that these active chess players should be acquiring new chunks and templates in every tournament game and should therefore be improving based on familiarization and discrimination of their networks. Yet such improvement is rarely observed. Improvement in chess requires deliberate practice. It is unclear how the notion of chunks and templates can be reconciled with the concept of deliberate practice, which emphasizes the role of explicit learning processes in response to feedback. Template models would need uh, to incorporate the explicit nature of deliberate practice and its basis of feedback as a corrective mechanism to account for the real world phenomenon in improvements of expert performance. Finally, several further issues can be raised. Template theory is thus far unable to identify actual chess templates empirically. Given the nature of the template slots, it continues to rely on two second boundary for chunk identification, which was earlier argued to be problematic. For instance, Gobe and colleagues have attempted to examine chunk size, size based on this methodology, but have not demonstrated strong reliable statistics for these chunks. Without empirical observations of these chunks, empirical falsifications of their characteristics and impendent validation of their existence will be difficult, if not impossible. Moreover, the emphasis for fast pattern recognition process over slower search processes have been challenged by Van Harreveld, uh, Wagon Makers, and Vandermas. These authors argue using data from online chess play at different time controls and from time control and FIDE World Championship matches that skill differences are diminished when chess players have less time to make their move selections. A new theory of chess skill. Earlier we described how De Groot viewed chess skill as more and more refined principles. As chess players improve, something must be stored in long-term memory to allow them to improve from deliberate practice. Also, long-term working memory provides a candidate mechanism for how information can be stored in long-term memory during actual chess play, avoiding the problems with short-term memory discussed previously. Moreover, stronger chess players may somehow encode a chess position in such a way that they can cue the increasingly refined principles long-term memory productions to select potential moves through a process of planning and calculation. The refinement and acquisition of these principles would explain the need for deliberate practice during explicit skill acquisition in contrast to template theory, which allows implicit learning. Another important question is what are the major empirical findings that a theory of chess expert performance must ultimately explain? I submit there are four primary phenomena, each of which is replicable and theoretically relevant. The first are the search characteristics during move selection tasks, such as correlation between depth of search and chess skill. The move selection task is a task representative of chess expert performance and thus captures the essence of chess skill. Second phenomenon must be explained in blindfold chess performance, indisputable as an impressive and real phenomenon of memory and cognition. Third, the theory must be compatible with the notion of deliberate practice and how mere experience tends to predict chess improvement poorly. Finally, the theory must be able to account for memory recall interactions that form the empirical backbone of older chunking and template theories. The success of any theory of chess skill will depend on its consistency with these four phenomena, as well as its advancement of testable novel predictions. Naturally, the theory must ultimately be compatible with all empirical findings, but these robust and well-replicated data are central to any new theoretical approach. A broad description of chess move selection consistent with some earlier theories is that a a perception restructuring cycles. According to this general description, when skilled chess players attempt to find a good move, they first perceive a goal position, then attempt to close the problem space, find a sequence of moves that leads from the initial position to the goal position. The perception of such a problem space is termed a perception. When the problem space cannot be closed, they restructure, meaning that they find a new apperception for the position and thus a new goal position, which they attempt to reach via move sequences. Therefore, weaker players can find, cannot find correct moves either because they do not find correct problem space, they do not aperceive the appropriate goal state, or because they're unable to correctly close the appropriate problem space, find a sequence of moves from the initial position to a correctly aperceived goal position. Uh, Sari Luma's work emphasizes the importance of problem spaces and this description is consistent with the group's observation of progressive deepening, but it does not explain how stronger players achieve such aperceptive powers and precisely what processes lead to the aperception of appropriate problem spaces. 
but in general, the notions of pattern recognition, long-term memory encoding of chess relationships, production-based move generation, chess knowledge, positional evaluation, problem space closure, and goal states all have some form of support and to of appeal. Here I submit a new theory that incorporates many of these elements as parsimoniously as possible to explain the key empirical facts from chess research. Proposal of a new theory. In this section, I will outline a new framework for a theory of chess skill and its acquisition. I will begin by describing the general outline of the framework. Then I will describe how chess players select a strong move in a chess position based on the framework, how a chess player improves in skill, and how other findings are to be compatible with this view. To begin, the framework assumes the basic cognitive architecture present in earlier theories, namely a long-term memory that is assessed via cues and short-term memory, where short-term memory is limited in its capacity, while separate short-term stores may exist for visual and for verbal phenological information. I will be primarily concerned with visual short-term memory in relation to chess play to store a cue for, to a long-term working memory retrieval structure. Moreover, a central executive or high-level attention component manipulates the contents of short-term memory based on goals, initiate goal-related processes, and other high-level information. Hence, this architecture derives from uh, Badley, 1986. Tasks such as dual task and other complex tasks uh, may tap the central executive, whereas basic memory paths st uh, span tasks like digit span, primary tap verbal short-term memory. Importantly, empirical evidence suggests that central executive is required during the selection of chess moves from studies of dual task interference where verbal short-term memory most likely plays only a minor role at best. At its heart, however, the model will further incorporate into long-term memory three sets of productions. They are uh, piece on square, piece on square productions, allowing the creation of piece relationships and generalization of long-term working memory retrieval structures. A set of structure evaluation productions that evaluate the critical relationships of a position and determine which is most significant and a set of goal generation production that can produce goal positions for players to attempt to reach through planning. As these productions are memory elements, they have the typical properties of memory elements, such as differing activation levels, increase from frequent use or decrease from disuse. This model will be fully elaborate rated below, and I will discuss why each component is necessary. The core of this theory is that peace relationships are the fundamental units of information used by chess players. As I will argue, these relationships are formed from knowledge of the rules of chess and knowledge of general chess principles in the beginning of a skill acquisition process, but are later formed automatically using highly specific productions after extended deliberate practice. I propose that upon seeing a chess position, several steps must take place. First, relevant relationships between pieces must be rapidly discovered and stored in a long-term memory representation, namely the retrieval structure. Second, high-level information must be activated to begin calculation and planning with updates to the retrieval structure during this process. Finally, a move is selected. Hence, the model must describe how a relationship is discovered in a position and thus how multiple discovered relationships form a representation of the position, how relationships are evaluated to determine goals for planning, how moves are considered and eventually selected, and how deliberate practice can improve this process. How peace relationships are discovered and the construction of a representation. In my wording, I use the word, the term discovered relationships. To clarify, relationships can be formed between any two or more pieces on the chessboard, regardless of novelty. However, many such relationships would be irrelevant to a chess player. It need not be the task of the chess player to form as many relationships as possible, but instead to find a set of relationships that best facilitates move selection. In other words, the task is to find as many relevant relationships as possible, argue that superior chess players not only construct such relations more rapidly than do weaker players to more quickly reach a memory representation of the entire position, but also are superior in finding more of the relevant relationships. As a consequence, superior chess players make fewer gross mistakes and blunders, in part due to not failing to find appropriate relationships, such relationships that can be then advantageously discovered by the opponent, and that they also construct a memory representation more rapidly, explains their superior memory recall of chess positions, which we'll explain more thoroughly below. The following description will illustrate why this is the case. 
Every chess player knows the basic rules of chess, and these rules are stored in long-term memory. For these rules alone, a chess player can form relations in a position. For instance, a chess player knows the movement of a knight and can identify whether a knight is able to capture an opponent's uh, piece. Moreover, developing chess novices learn general position principle, double pawns are weak, thematic tactical motives, pins and skewers that help the player form relevant relationships. While solving move selection problem, a novice could identify a number of relationships in a position with sufficient time. However, not only does this process take substantial time, but storage of these relationships for use in planning is non-trivial for such novices. The average chess middle game position typically contains about 25 chess pieces with a large number of possible attacked events relationships. The beginner could adopt a number of strategies for maintaining these relationships in short-term working memory, such as using verbal labels or verbal short-term memory, storage in verbal, visual short-term memory, or with effort in elaborate long-term memory for a set of relationships could be formed. But this set would slowly assessed and subject to massive interference and forgetting, similar to many respects of a word list. To adapt and improve, a novice must be able to find these and other relationships more quickly and store them more flexibly, flexibly and accessibly. To accomplish this first task, the novice must somehow use information from previous chess experience to predict what relationships will be discovered. Hence, information about possible relationships must be already stored in long-term memory, which I argue is stored as productions. If piece uh, P1 is on square S1 and piece P2 is on S2 and other information, then encode, um, you know, so-and-so. And the other information here could include previous positions or the specific opponent. But this factor typically plays a minor role in the prim primarily included for generality. The cognitive output of this production is twofold. It directs an eye movement towards and the appropriate piece is found there. A relationship is formed which I denote, uh, um, you know, refer to the piece on square, piece on square productions, and they allow the player to encode relationships between pieces of chess production, uh, chess positions based on stored long-term memory knowledge. Important piece on square, piece on square productions can output a relationship between only two pieces or several different pieces. For instance, a production might be as complex as uh, you know, multiple pieces, this is possible when piece on square productions are learned initially via deliberate search for relationships in chess position by repeatedly applying rules and principles, which are unlimited in their piece on square scope. This leaves us to explain the second task, how and where the player can store the new relationships and other information accessibly and uh, flexibly. Consider the following example. When a, a beginner first discovers the white pawn on E5 can take a black pawn on D6, Without help from a piece on square, piece on square productions, the beginner must store this relationship somewhere for the moment. But the fact that a white pawn on e5 can take a black pawn on d6 now is a long term memory trace, though it might not be immediately accessible at first due to interference from other encoded relationships or due to lack of consolidation. <coughs> <coughs> Given repeated exposure to this relationship, the beginner's trace is strengthened and eventually becomes a piece on square, piece on square production. But importantly, the beginner can connect the square E5 with the square D6 with this production. All specific pawn captures can potentially be associated with specific productions. Hence now, when a new position is analyzed, the production will fire as the beginner encodes a white pawn E5, the resulting search of the D6 square revealing a black pawn will now create a piece on square piece on square production, relationships stored in long-term memory. Suppose now that the beginner now encodes uh, another relationship uh, like D6, C7, a more complex representation can form the commonality between these squares, so E5, D6, C7. Note that there's a more complex long-term memory representation associates each piece with a specific square on the chess board with sufficient thinking time and with the longer term accumulation of piece on square, piece on square production to speed up the process. The chess player can form a representation for the entire position that maps each piece to a specific square and preserves encoded piece relationships, the time to accomplish this based on the existence and nature of the piece on square, piece on square productions. Ultimately, the long term memory representations uniting the squares on the chessboard can be referenced by a single cue in short-term memory as an organized retrieval structure to assess locations on pieces 
Note that particularly for weak novices, the retrieval structure may be less than 64 squares in some cases. This illustrates the generative nature of the retrieval structure is different from something like a fixed method of loci journeys, as was confused by Gobe in 1998. It is interesting to note that the piece on square, piece on square productions can explain the speed differences between an intermediate player and a master on the night tour task. Both players can know how to legally move a knight, but the master has more sophisticated knowledge of the chessboard in terms of knight movements, such as knowing that knight A1 is connected to B3 due to these productions. It is important to stress that these long-term memory productions and therefore the ability to generate retrieval structures rapidly are deliberately learned as a player repeatedly searches for peace relationships during practice and play, but a player does not use effort to search for new peace relationships. New productions will not be learned. Notably, I suggest that some repetition may be necessary for an initially formed memory trace to uh, active production. However, whether a specialized neurological consideration process is required goes beyond the scope of this initial theoretical formulation. For instance, an intermediate player with a working knowledge of many productions for finding peace relationships may rely on the relatively effortless process of constructing representations from the pre-stored knowledge already learned productions. Moreover, even when a player encodes a novel relationship actually during chess play, unless the same relationship is found again in future games or positions, will not be a piece on square, piece on square productions. Most games contain some extremely specific elements that are unlikely to be repeated, particularly after the opening. In other words, during most game circumstances, an experienced chess player either activates existing piece on piece, piece on piece on square productions or encodes novel relationships that are too rare to be recoded, re-encoded enough in the future. Under these conditions, most experienced players will fail to learn new production even after a large number of recreation or tournament games. A little Graham. Yes, Mr. Chills, I had a, a big uh, late dinner. I'm about to wrap up a little more. I'll probably eat again. Consider a concrete example. So I'm going to skip his example and... Uh, so summarizes, player searches for new relationships in chess positions. Those the player does not automatically find productions are slowly formed over time. With a set of such productions, the skilled player encountering new positions can rapidly find many relationships and store them accessibly in retrievable structure that maps pieces to square and preserves piece relationships. A cue to the retrieval structure being stored in visual short-term memory, the more relevant productions pro uh, possessed. The more rapidly a player can generate an integrated representation, the less likely the player will overlook important relationships contained in the position. These descriptions are also consistent with the eye movements of chess players upon exposure to a position given the tendency to direct eye along peace relationships. Moreover, the description is consistent with other findings. Chess players may more rapidly count minor pieces, even in quasi-random positions. Through the use of complex piece on square, piece on square productions, facilitated finding of the pieces. The famous skill by uh, typically presentation time interactions explain given that the quasi random position will tr not trigger productions as readily. So, at very brief presentations, the skill advantage in memory recall will occur primarily for typical positions, as in quasi random positions with less typically piece placements than skilled player cannot as rapidly use the greater number of productions to his advantage. However, given more time, expert players can realize this advantage with the greater number of productions being serially activated, allowing more of the spear knowledge to play a larger role with more time. Also, the tendency for such memory recall scores to gradually increase with greater encoding time suggests a serial process of encoding rather than parallel matching of chunks, which would produce a curve far more sawtooth. Moreover, when quasi-random positions are presented auditorily, experts still recall a uh, recall advantage, which fits well with the notion of productions helping predict a store relationship even in those quasi-random positions. Finally, these productions and their general generation of retrieval structures allow the player to play chess with outside of the board, as in blindfold chess. A better player with more sophisticated retrieval structure can better maintain different piece relationships as they would exist on an actual board, reducing the differences between sighted play and blindfold play as playing strength increases. Finally, the stronger players rely more on learned long-term working memory retrieval structures and less on storage of relationships and short-term memory in an episodic list-like long-term memory is consistent with the findings that IQ-related 
ability test decrease in predictive power as skill improves. Overall, the description proposed here derives from earlier frameworks such as long-term working memory, and it captures much of the intuitive appeal of chunks and templates. Evaluation, planning, and search for the best move. As the player begins to establish a representation of position capturing important pieces relationship, the player must evaluate the relationships and generate possible move addressing these evaluations. It should be noted that the representation of the position need not be completed before search processes begin, and often new relationships are updated in long-term working memory during search. In some cases, the discovery of a new relationship in the position during search may force the player to consider entirely different plans. Regardless, it's clear from players' verbal protocols and other findings that this search process allows the discovery of stronger moves and is an integral part of the problem-solving process. Uh, Sarah Luma discusses how a player must work to reach a goal state from a given initial position or structure. He describes the process of closing a problem space, and when this is not possible, restructuring the search to reach a new goal state. However, I will argue that this is only one of two varieties of search processes. I will henceforth prefer the process as closer search process, differentiating from a process where players do not have a clear goal position in mind, but rather make several candidate moves and evaluate the resulting position. In the later case, the player is not trying to reach a specific goal state, given that players will not always have a goal state, but instead is examining several potential moves and evaluating what is found. I will refer to the latter search processes as evaluative search. In order to search, candidate moves must be generated, but such moves are worthless without some method to determine the quality of positional structures arising from such moves. Beginning chess players lacking any knowledge of how to evaluate chess positions are likely to base decisions on attack-defense relations, particularly if they know the relative values of different pieces. A beginner, after discovering the relationship that a bishop can take a queen, may immediately play this move without further consideration, or given time and energy, may attempt to examine the consequences of this play. If this important later case, an evaluated search process is initiated. The player will view the square in which the queen will move and examine further whether other pieces can attack the square. If, for instance, the player discovers that opponent's knight uh, can capture the queen there, the valuation of gaining a bishop but losing a queen is bad, and the player rejects this line of play. However, the player could better generate attack-defense relationships with the square, the appropriate evaluation could be more rapidly and accurately determined. This is particularly true if the search process extends several moves deep and entails multiple squares of interest, in this case, having a more sophisticated retrieval structure becomes critical to keep track of many different attack-defense relationships at once. As the beginning beginner improves, many types of structures are frequently encountered both in play and in instructional chess books, pawn structures, relative locations of major pieces, location of both kings, existence of certain pieces, among other factors, are important considerations, as are tactical structures such as pins, potential double attacks, overwork pieces, trap pieces, to name but a few. The player must not only identify the existence of these relationships, but must also evaluate them as favorable or unfavorable. The accuracy of the evaluation process requires extensive refined knowledge specific to the different types of positions that goes beyond the overly generic nature of valuations found in basic checks principles. For instance, in some positions, a specific pin might be very devastating for one player, whereas in others, it might play only a minor role. Through both reading instructional chess books and through experimentation in chess play, an improving player slowly develops the skill at correctly evaluating these structures, not only in isolation, but relative to other position relationships in a given position. This evaluative knowledge forms the higher level understanding of chess and is represented by the higher level production, which denotes structure evaluation production of the form if relationships uh, then assign relative value to each relationship and return the most critical relationship. Notably, these relationships correspond both to all relationships in a position, both those found deliberately and those triggered by piece on square, piece on square productions, the output of the relationship um, each of these relationships receives an evaluation in the context of the other existing relationships and the relationship with the greatest good for me or bad for opponent evaluation is the one chosen. The relationship may be as associated with verbal labels in some cases like double pawns, pin on the night, which often emerge in verbalizations and think aloud protocols. Such verbal labels exist due to the number of learned learning processes such as learning of general principles. For example, a beginner may evaluate double pawns as negative 
of possible general principle. This incurs an intermediate step where a discovered relationship must be identified as double pawns before evaluating as negative. However, of greater experience, specific relationships um, more rapidly encoded during POS, POS productions, these general principles quickly use, lose utility given that the evaluation of any piece relationship is highly specific to a particular position. Some double pawn formations are often uh, more good than bad. What matters for evaluation is not that they are double pawns, what specific uh, double pawn formation it is, and what other relationships exist in a position. For the novice, these structure evaluation productions will initially be relatively simple in nature, possibly focusing on evaluation of single relationship or a handful of relationships. Once returned by a structure evaluation production, the relationship is transferred to the central executive as a goal to resolve this relationship. Once the goal resolution is initiated, the third set of productions, goal generation productions are activated. These productions take an input, the relationship and generate a goal position. This allows the player to engage in closer search, a new argument, the central executive goal state to look for pieces and examine moves that create the position and no such productions are fired the player must instead engage in evaluative search unless a novel goal state has been created however the player is now beginning closer search the player's central executive by examining the view position for relevant pieces considers moves by updating the long-term working memory structure and examining the memory representation triggering structure evaluation productions to reevaluate the position once the goal has been resolved the search terminates and a move is selected Notably, goals generated by the these productions are similar in nature to the long-term memory constellations of pieces from chunking theories. The goal generation productions are learned in long-term memory when players create novel goals when solved in positions and learning specific maneuvers and move sequences from games and chess books and from game analysis. And similar to the earlier arguments for creating new POS, POS productions, an intermediate player will be unlikely to learn a new goal generation production if the player avoids creating general novel goals in position and only creates novel goals that are unlikely to be repeated. As a result, playing recreational tournament games is unlikely to improve skill once a working set of goal generation productions exist. Notably, the correct evaluation of relationships is absolutely critical. I argue that weaker players, aside from failing to discover relationships, often incorrectly evaluate and prioritize goals incorrectly. This leads many weaker players to consider searching of lines of play that stronger players would never examine. Such blind alley searches are frequently observed in inverted protocols. Moreover, weaker players may avoid certain lines of play because they incorrectly evaluate resulting structures as bad, notably the basic argument and generally consistent with Holding's emphasis on search and evaluation, and the production can potentially explain the often contradictory quantitative findings from verbal protocols. As previously noted, there is currently some evidence for a correlation between depth of search and chess skill, but in some positions, stronger players may search these less deeply. Based on the proposed model, what's critical to the determining depth of search is what relationship has received top priority due to evaluation and whether specific goal positions have been generated for a closer search. Often, differentiating skilled players are not prioritizing the same re relationship structure and are actually engaging in different searches. I would expect a novice player to search more deeply than a grandmaster in some positions if the novice incorrectly evaluates a structure requiring extensive searching as the top priority. On average, however, stronger players will search more deeply for two reasons. First, they will be more likely to engage in a closer search, having access to a greater number of goal generating productions with a goal position to reach. Greater depth might must often be examined than with a search that merely evaluates different possible attempted moves. Second is they can more rapidly identify relevant relationships. They will essentially have more relationships to evaluate in long-term working memory at any point in the search process. It is not an ability per se to search more deeply, but rather the identification of new problems, evaluated relationships to solve as they consider lines of play, the long-term working memory retrieval structure, keeping track of pieces, locations, and relationships during the planning calculation process, hence all three production types, POS, POS structure evaluation, and goal generation productions can lead to greater depth of search or an average uh, for stronger chess players. Moreover, I expect stronger players to search with greater breadth of, on average for this same later reason that they will have more potential problems to resolve 
But again, there will always be positions where stronger players search less broadly than weaker players due to differences in evaluations and the relationships encoded. Finally, stronger players will calculate more moves per unit time on average, given that they more rapidly encode these relationships using POS, POS productions, and more often generate goals for closer search with goal generation productions. Unfortunately, current research data, current search data are mixed in a large sample of broad range of skill has not been examined. Overall structure evaluation productions are grown and refined through reading chess books and experimenting in actual analysis, and this constitutes a critical element in improving chess skill. Moreover, accurate feedback is critical in refining these productions, and access to extremely powerful chess computers and chess coaches is useful in accuracy, evaluating specific structures. An intermediate player unable to evaluate properly, often due to relying too much on very general principles, rather than on far more specific principles relative to their type of position. We'll go down many blind alleys, together with slower speed and less accurate encoding of piece relationships and less knowledge of potential goal state maneuvers. The player will reliably underperform a very strong player with much greater quantities of deliberate practice. Given the skilled player's enhanced speed and accuracy at discovering relevant relationships, superior ability to evaluate and trigger potential goal states is not surprising that speed chess captures most of the variance in chess skill. Better players find relationships faster and keep track of them better. And given some sufficient skill differences, a strong player can find relationships at a speed superior enough to play with a time disadvantage. Novel predictions of the theory. This theory is ultimately based on production relating stored organizations. Presto, to briefly summarize the major claims of Presto, chess beginners initially learn chess rules, basic general principles, and tactical themes and use these to form relationships with effort. More advanced chess skill is partially presented, represented by POS POS productions that allow rapid automatic identification of relationships and the generation of the retrieval structure of long term memory. More advanced chess skills partially represented by structure evaluation productions that allow precise assessments of relationships and later prioritization for goals. More advanced chess skills partially represented by goal generation production that can generate potential goal states to direct a player's close of search. All productions are acquired during explicit learning processes that the theory is almost entirely production based, all by three different types of productions. In its attempt to explain chess memory, problem solving, and other phenomenon gives a greater parsimony and power than traditional chunking and template models, which frequently incorporated additional mechanisms when going beyond the memory recall data. Moreover, the theory is tied to basic cognitive models, unlike older models such as SEEK. This theory makes several novel predictions. First, superior search data can address the predictions that stronger players on average search deeper, broader, and more rapidly, and that this trend should extend throughout the distribution of chess skill rather than plateauing around 2,000 strength. Second, there are uh, predictions regarding the practice activities relevant to skill improvement. Specifically, players must engage in activities where they search for new relationships in positions and consistently test specific types of structures for improved evaluation. Moreover, specific practice activities should correlate with specific research on characteristics, given that the search characteristics are a function of learned productions rather than domain-specific talent for searching ahead in chess. Chess activities may be classified as those where feedback on evaluation of structures is possible, such as coaching, analysis of database, reading chess books, and playing powerful chess computers, and those where evaluation feedback is far more difficult and less likely, such as playing in tournament or recreational games, playing speed chess, and playing other games similar to but different from chess. The theory presented here suggests much stronger correlations with the former group, particularly after regression analysis reveal independent sources of contributed variants. Furthermore, practical activities will allow for forming novel relationships in a chess position and for generation of novel goals should likewise correlate with the search characteristics. Additionally, chess beginners are more likely to show some improvement from playing recreational tournament games. This is provided that they engage in explicit process to find relevant peace relationships and create novel goal states, whereas more advanced players can rely on the already acquired productions. It should be noted, however, that merely playing chess alone without even later analyzing one's game, is far from a deal as these pledging players will have trouble getting feedback on incorrect evaluations and will not easily be able to experiment with different structures to learn appropriate structure evaluation production. Finally, feedback for improved evaluation is critical for improving chess skill, particularly with the structure evaluation productions. Regarding this, chess history has long shown dynamic changes in the types of position professional chess players reach in their games, and some of the chess community believe that chess 
skill is rising over historic time, particularly at the highest levels, given that evaluations of the positional structures are often learned from published chess games, books, and other material. Number of books owned even predicts chess rating. The valuations for many structures is likely becoming more and more accurate over time. If more modern players learn the more modern evaluations of such structures, they will reach superior levels of skill than players of previous generations of having superior quality structure evaluation production. Moreover, greater qualities of access to such material would facilitate the acquisition of chess skill for the same reason. Access to superior material environments and trainers will facilitate accurate learning of structure evaluation productions, hence finding a rise in skilled performance at the highest levels of chess skill would be consistent with Presto in contrast to other notions that equate chess skill more with the quantity of chunks in long-term memory or with notions that one's ultimate level of chess performance is limited by inherent genetic factors. A specific production used by a chess player can be observed in different ways. First, given that players often verbalize peace relationships when thinking out loud, during move selection, potentially new POS, POS productions could be noted by players' verbalization of these relations. Subsequent exposure positions also containing the relationships should show evidence for stored productions. For instance, players should more rapidly identify this relationship than control group and be more likely to solve the problem if the relationship is relevant to the solution. Moreover, eye tracking could be used to test POS, POS production. Face process models for solving a given position to set up POS, POS productions would make specific predictions for eye movements of players and observed eye tracking data could rule out specific models similar to the verbal protocols and methodology. Likewise, verbalizations in protocols could be used to rule out specific process models of set evaluations in gold generation productions for a given position. Therefore, the model described in this paper allows researchers to understand the thoughts generated by differentially skilled players for any given position Better players would be expected on average to possess most of the same POS, POS productions as weaker players and greater quality and quantity of structure evaluation and goal generation productions. Okay, so this is said it's a PhD thesis, and this man actually goes on to attempt to test it, and he you know, gets chess players, he has a method, he has uh, you know, participants, he gets 180 players, of various uh, rating strength, um, um, groups them. He has a move selection, uh, activities questionnaire, procedure, and, uh, and then the mathematical um, evaluation. And the, the results are here. So people have to Google to uh, get this uh, form, and to get this uh, paper. Uh, at, at the beginning. Um, so that's it. Thanks, uh, Muhammad. Shalom. Mr. Chill, thanks for being concerned about my diet. So uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to ramble too much now. I think I'm just going to end the stream. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I read, you know, besides for the actual research project, but, but uh, you know, Roaring there gives a very good history uh, an analysis of the various different factors and, and uh, what we know. And uh, Duvid, with his experience coaching, you know, kind of, so to say, the gimmick, you know, I help run at the Detroit Institute of Arts, where teaching young children to be able to beat average adults um, makes sense within this. So I didn't conduct, you know, formal experiments, just coaching kids and then setting them up against random players. Um, but, you know, just thinking it through in my own introspection of how when I play chess myself. So it's very interesting and, you know, larger related to mechanisms of cognitive dissonance. And, uh, you know, later then I'm going to tie this into the multiple truth hypothesis. So Duvid will be advancing my own theory, the multiple truth hypothesis. That will be a greater theory of how the mind performs thought that will include chess. But like, you know, as Roaring mentions in the paper, that uh, studies on how chess mind uh, performs thought in chess is one of the most developed of all um, studies. And, uh, you know, Duba's a chess player, and, and you know, if you kind of demonstrate this and play the chess, and you maybe make it a little interesting, um, you know, by, by, you know, doing things like the gimmick at the DAA, where I could teach a little kid how to play chess, and they could beat your average adult. And, uh, you, you know, also maybe Crazy House, Horde, you know, competing at a world uh, top players in the world 
um, versus other feats, like I mentioned, uh, you know, learning languages. Uh, I didn't mention that one, but uh, speed reading and all these other various uh, topics of expertise. What does it mean to be a better thinker? And if it's like chess, where there's not a correlation, the correlation is basically effort. You become a better thinker by working at it. And so I mentioned at the beginning of the stream, like uh, think like a grandmaster. Uh, some of these books on chess are really some of the greatest books on meditation ever written. But it's like, okay, like a book on Kabbalah is assuming that a person's an Orthodox Jew or like a book, uh, you know, on like Krishna is assuming someone's a Hindu, although it could be a great book on meditation. So chess, some of these chess books are really the greatest books for training one's mind, but it uses chess as the method to do it. So do vid continue with that, uh, you know, so to say idea. Appreciate people tuning in and, uh, um, you know, stay tuned for more. I have a lot more stuff on my desk to put out. So hopefully I'm going to be producing some of these streams and, and these may not be worth too much to the general public, um, you know, but do vid uh, as at least, you know, being the first uh, person to uh, volunteer to be experimented in my own tests that I can record myself and watch myself back may prove useful to other people later, or we're just a learning exercise, like I mentioned, the memory graph and the proven techniques for memorization relating to chunking that I expressed in this video. Well, I got 11 likes, so I appreciate that. So blessings to everybody. I'm going to sign off. Have a great day.